that any member of the public addressing council must extend due courtesy and respect to council and the process under which it operates and must take direction from the chair whenever called on to do so. Speakers must remain respectful and statements or questions must not be defamatory, offensive or objectionable, aimed at embarrassing a councillor or, council or a member of council staff or relate to a matter outside the powers of council. The first item tonight is request to attend by electronic means. I've been advised by the CEO that we do not have any requests to attend electronically for tonight's meeting. We'll move on to apologies. Councillors, do we have any apologies? Councillor Bond? Uh, Councillor Pearl is running about 20 minutes late, so he will be here about 6.50. Fantastic. So we'll note in the minutes that Councillor Pearl will be arriving later and the exact time he arrives will be recorded. Moving on to the minutes of the previous meetings. Councillors, the minutes of the council meeting held on the 7th of June 2023 have been circulated. Are there any questions regarding these minutes? If not, can I have a motion to confirm these minutes? Moved by Councillor Martin. Second, I think it was that Councillor Bond, your hand up there? Sorry. It, the room is very wide. My peripheral vision is it's not catching you all. Okay, on to declarations of conflict of interest. Does anyone have a conflict of interest in a matter being discussed at tonight's meeting? I see none. Sorry, point of oh, order, Mayor. Did we actually vote on those minutes? Oh, we didn't. Thank you. <laughs> That's a good start. Let's go back. All right. Councillor Martin moved it. Second, Councillor Bond. Thank you. I now put this motion to the vote. All those in favour? Carried unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Group effort to get through tonight. Double header. If you didn't know, we were here last night. Long, late council meeting. Okay. We'll go back to conflicts of interest. Give it the full... Everybody's good? No conflicts of interest tonight? Okay, public question time. Thank you for coming tonight. Now's the opportunity to address the um, councillors. We will hear the public questions and submissions of report items. So you're allowed to ask a question of council, but if it's an item on the agenda tonight, you are speaking to it. Rather than asking a question, a councillor may take up a question if you have one on a report tonight at the item. Now there are 10 people on my list and I've made the decision to make them two minutes each. So when I call upon your name, please come up to, we have two tables, but I don't think it really matters. Maybe go to the center one. Yeah, come in the middle one here. Um, I'll need you to say your full name, your suburb, and then you'll have the two minutes to speak. The first, we'll do the in-person first, and then we have some virtual ones we'll go to after. I call upon Sean McCauley, speaking to item 14.1, notice of motion, Councillor Tim Baxter reaffirm, reaffirming commitment to the LGBTIQA plus community. Hi, Sean. Sorry, real quick. There needs to be a red light. So if you push the button, do you see re a red light? Good. So name, suburb, two minutes, please. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean Mulcahy. I work with the Victorian Pride Lobby's Rainbow Local Government Campaign, which is based at the Pride Centre in St Kilda and works with councils across the state on LGBTIQA plus inclusion. Uh, the Pride Centre, as you would well know, is a testament to council's commitment to the inclusion of LGBTIQA plus people in Port Phillip and the broader community. And it's always a highlight of the year to walk down Fitzroy Street and past the Pride Centre as part of the annual Midsummer Pride March. However, Port Phillip, like other councils across the state, is confronting an upsurge in hate against the LGBTIQA plus community, our allies and our supporters, most especially our wonderful librarians who are simply doing their job to support the community. And that's why it's important to call this out for what it is. Far-right neo-Nazis terrorising our libraries, terrorising the staff that work there, and terrorising parents and their children who want to attend colourful, popular storytime events and should be able to do so in peace and safety. And it bears repeating again that children and their parents should never be the target of hate. That's why it's so important that this motion commits Council to work with the LGBTIQA Plus Advisory Committee and the Municipal Association of Victoria and hopefully Victoria Police on the safe delivery of LGBTIQA Plus programs and events and to report back on this important work by the end of the year. We know that there are many ways in which events can be delivered safely, but it requires council to work with the community and the broader local government sector, as well as police, to send a powerful message that hate will never win. It never has, and it never will. 
I hope all councillors will reflect on how important it is to show support for the LGBTIQA plus community in the face of hateful attacks, most especially our rainbow families and young people, and support this motion in a spirit of love and acceptance. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you and for accommodating my need to leave early. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer any clarifying questions we may have in respect of the issues raised with the Mayor's indulgence. Thank, thank you. you, Sean. Any clarifying questions? Good. Well, thank you for coming. I call upon Claire Proctor speaking to item 14.1, the notice of motion from Tim Baxter. Councillor Tim Baxter. Hi, Claire. Hello. So, yeah, my name is Claire. Uh, I'm a trans woman using she, her pronouns. I live Sorry, in- Sorry, real quick. If you name, suburb, and yes. then we'll start the two minutes. Thank you. Right. My name, uh, my name is Claire Proctor. Uh, I live in South Bank. Thank you. Uh, I also work for Transgender Victoria, often working out of the Pride Centre over in uh, St Kilda. I'm here as a local rather than on behalf of Transgender Victoria but my work there has given me a look at the front lines of a battle that we really wish wasn't happening. I want to start by, uh, uh, by reiterating and thanking uh, Sean for mentioning uh, that uh, Port Phillip is a, very, uh, is a very proud heartland of the queer community. Uh, so I know this isn't a hostile crowd, but unfortunately the community has been seeing increased amounts of abuse and attacks thrown its way over this past year. Events like that rally on Parliament steps that we wish didn't happen, physical attacks on other members of the queer community, and the forced cancellation of multiple queer and drag-focused events in the face of violent and hateful threats. Speaking from Transgender Victoria, I've seen firsthand the damage that this sort of environment has created, both to the people that we support and sometimes to us ourselves. Several of our outreach and education programs have had to make uh, changes specifically to make sure that our employees and volunteers, not to mention the trans and gender diverse people that we support, feel safe and protected. And let me tell you now, having to visibly increase security for an event we held on Trans Day of Visibility doesn't make for the happiest and most affirming environment for anybody. And when events that should be safe spaces to express one's gender are being shut down specifically for safety concerns, I've already started seeing the pains that it's causing and it isn't going to get better by itself. We need support so that we can be comfortable just being who we are. In the face of rising hostilities against the queer community, it's not enough for an ally to simply rest on the notion that you're already doing good and all you have to do is keep doing what you're doing. We need more. If the voices against the queer community get louder, the voices for the queer community need to get louder in turn, to provide more support than before, to make it clear that our community is safe for queer people. And as a council representing such a large queer community, I do want to see Port Phillip take that sort of stand for people like us. Thank you, we Claire. That has been two minutes. I really appreciate you coming again. Thank you. I call upon Jenny Roper speaking to item 10.1, Adoption of Community Amenity Law 2023. Hi, Jenny. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Jenny Roper and I live in St Kilda. Thank you. This is a once time in a generation opportunity to help solve the issues that have been created in St Kilda. As per your community consultation report, 63% of the people that completed this report came from St Kilda. The key findings in this report proves that there is a major community safety concern for St Kilda. 92% strongly support the proposed changes to Clause 17, Behaviour on Council Land, aimed at addressing nuisance behaviour in our area. 91% strongly support the proposed changes to Clause 43, Furniture and Other Items on Council Land and Footpaths. I'm hoping that all councillors and mayors support what the community want as per the community consultation. It would be disappointing to see and hear that those who object have not supported the community wishes. I'm disappointed that there are no changes to the camping laws and that it wasn't part of the community consultation. The community has been asking for changes for the last 10 years and have been directed by council officers to advocate for this law. I attended the local law safety forum which was held by the police at St Kilda Town Hall. It was made pretty clear to me that they need all the assistance they can get from the local community and council. 
if we can work with the police in securing more local laws to assist in Fitzroy, Ackland and Carlisle Street, it would be beneficial to everyone. We can't change the state laws, but we can change and improve the City of Port Phillip local laws. I am currently liaising with our current Minister's office, and they had advised that they are advocating for PSOs for Fitzroy and Ackland streets, and will be walking these streets with Minister Carbine. I am hoping that the City of Port Phillip can also advocate and get in contact with Minister Josh Burns, offering 100% support in this. I am asking the councillors to focus on the residents they are rep representing and for you to base this on community requirements and not your personal preference. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Oh, perfect timing. Uh, I call upon Matthew Cadet, speaking to item 10.2, uh, approach to review of the Move, Collect, Live Integrated Transport Strategy. Hi, Matthew. Hi, good evening. My name is Matthew Cadet. I live in St. Kilda East. Thank you. I am here today representing the Port Phillip Bike User Group, and I would like to address the proposed changes to the inter uh, Integrated Transport Strategy. I want to acknowledge that the integrated transport strategy is a well-researched response to the transport challenges our city faces, taking into consideration climate change and supporting vulner vulnerable communities. Extensive community consultation was conducted around the strategy, and it revealed that the most popular element of the plan was a proposed bike network. It is disheartening to see that instead of implementing this plan, the Council has delayed its progress and seemingly given preferences to narrow interest and behind-the-scenes lobbying. For instance, I would like to highlight the case of Carfan Road, separated by Lane, which was originally part of the Shrine, to, the Shrine to See project to be founded by state government. A community panel composed of people who live and work in the area recommended a fully separated bike lane. Furthermore, this bike lane was supported by the wide coalition of community groups, including the Heart Foundation, the Bicycle Network, Victoria Walks, Port Philip Emergent Climate Action Network, PCAN, the Port Philip Baykeeper, the Disability Resource Center, and the, Port, uh, the Public Transport Asso User Association. Despite, despite this broad support, a few councillors have opposed it, and the pro protected bike lane has been removed from the Shrine to See project. I want to bring attention to the officer recommendation in the report, section 2.6, which suggests an alternative approach to improving bike routes with, that does not prioritize fully protected bike corridors. We strongly disagree with this recommendation and firmly reject it. Extensive research in Australia and abroad has consistently shown that the safest and most attractive bike routes are those where people on bikes are separated from vehicles. This separation is especially important for the comfort and safety of older people, children, and women. We urge the Council to commit to, co to the network of protected bike lane as originally planned in the integrated transport strategy and construct them as quickly as possible using the state funding. I thank, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I just want to clarify that we actually haven't had a position yet on the Shrine to Sea and the separated bike lanes. Uh, it, that hasn't come through the chamber yet, so we haven't opposed it. It hasn't been um, in the opportunity yet. So, just so you know that. Thank you. Thank you. I call upon Michelle Thomas, submitting a question to Council. Hi, Michelle. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, my name's Michelle Thomas. I live in St Kilda. Thank you. Um, the, about 10 days ago, I received a notice from the council informing me about um, a concession per parking permit uh, increase or, or actually, well, it's an increase, but it's never had a, a cost on it before within the letter. Um, it didn't really state why the council has chosen to uh, inc put a price on a concession permit. Um, and it just, my question is, does the council not realise um, the cost of living difficulties that are around at the moment um, to, to put a, a cost on a concession parking permit doesn't seem to be a sensible thing in my mind. 
All right, let me have an officer. Uh, Nellie Montague, would you be able to provide an answer, please? Through you, Mayor. Thank you, Michelle, for your question. Um, the parking management policy review took place between September 2022 and the 17th of May 2023. Council sought additional feedback from the community on the scope of the review through the Have Your Say website between the 28th of November and the 19th of December 2022, and over 400 requests from the first year of the policy from the community were considered to understand how the first year of implementation of the parking management policy had gone. Feedback was received about the complexity and challenges with the first permit free subsequent parking permit concession fee process, especially from residents with multiple permits and for households with more than one person with a concession card. This complexity resulted in poor customer experiences and delays in receiving parking permits. As with all fees and charges charged by council, parking permit fees were considered as part of the 2022-2023 budget process. The flat fee of $25 for all concession card holder parking permits was endorsed to be rolled out from 1 July this year in comparison to full fee parking permits, which cost between $68 and $142 per parking permit. Mm, yeah, in recognition of the financial hardship um, that some in our community are facing, as part of the review, we also added an exceptional circumstance for financial hardship to waive the cost of the $25 fee if severe financial hardship is being faced. This will be available to all residents applying for parking permits after 1 July 2023. Thank you. Do, can I ask? Sorry, can you maybe ask it? I think that uh, that was the answer to the question you came and submitted, but if you need to have a little more clarity, that'd be great. Thank you. I call upon Alex Darton submitting a question to council. Hello, Alex. Mayor, councillors, uh, simple question. Would name? Do, sorry, uh, my name is Alex Darton. I live in Elwood. Um, I would like to help put on a renter's night, information night of the City of Port Phillip, and I was wondering how much the Council would offer to help facilitate this. So my question is, would you help facilitate groups of experts coming together to you know, inform the majority of your residents their rights in the times that we are living right now? On a side note, I'd like to point out with the LGBT community that, I can't speak for them, but from an anti-fascist point of view, you guys gave the far right a win by banning anything, um, and it's gonna, they're going to come back. Um, so, thanks for that. Thanks, Alex. Uh, can I refer, sorry, uh, Councillor? Am, am I able to ask uh, Mr. Darton a clarifying question? Uh, which, okay. which realm of renters' rights, basically? Yeah. hold on. Yeah. <laughs> the first question was about the renters, so I think it'd be fair to go to that first. So, Brian T., can I ask you to answer the first question? I threw you now. I think uh, Mark J is online to answer the question. Oh, sorry, Hope Mark not. J, are you online? Yes, hello there. Hello. And, um, thank you. Through you, Mayor, Council is aware of the issues confronting renters. Through our housing strategy, we are looking to ensure there is sufficient supply of housing, including for renters. Our sustainability initiatives are looking for opportunities to improve sustainability outcomes in homes, including those where we do have renters. To address the specific proposal raised by uh, Mr. Darton, an officer will make contact to thoroughly understand this request and see if council can support renters with initiatives such as a proposed information session. Thank you. Thank you. Now, also, I'd welcome you to email us with the request and we can see what we can also action as well. Certainly. So thank you for that. Uh, for the minutes, it's 6.54 that Councillor Pearl is joining us. Welcome. Now, asking a clarifying question on a statement. That's okay. Don't worry about okay. it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Now, the rest of the ones I have on my list are virtual that it, these people are joining us via the WebEx platform. So speakers, I hope you can hear me fine and I'll call your name. The governance team will unmute you and you'll need to accept this on your end. So look for a little notification that you're accepting to unmute. So our first person, Sean Lancashire. Do we have Sean? 
Submit a question to council. Yes? No? Hi, Sean, can you hear me? You can't hear me. Okay. Sorry? Shall we adjourn? Do you need a break? I can keep speaking if that's helping you to know if that's a problem. All right. There's a request to adjourn. Yes, adjourn for five minutes. Thank you. So back at seven o'clock, everyone. All right. We're going to start again. All right. She'll come back to her chair when she feels like it, huh? No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to read it again. Now we'll hear from our virtual speakers who have joined us via the WebEx platform. Speakers, as I call your name, on our governance team will unmute you, and you will need to accept this on your end, so look for the notification on your screen. I call upon Sean Lancashire submitting a question to Council. Sean, can you hear us? I can, thank you. Good evening, Councillors, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, my Welcome. name is Sean Lancashire. I'm the Deputy Principal at St Mary's College in East St Kilda and Windsor. We have two campuses across Dandenong Road. Uh, my question this evening is regarding the toilet block located nearby to the corner of Dandenong Road and Chapel Street. And uh, my question is just around um, whether Council can provide some assurances that there will be some movement on demolishing that block of toilets given the 10, 12, 15 year process that St Mary's College has had to engage in to put in place. Oh, did we lose you? Sean, are you still there? I think we've, it's cut out. If not, I have your question, so I might, if it's being recorded. He's still online. Yeah, you can hear us still? Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I'm sorry, I think you cut out. Can you tell me where I cut out, just so I don't repeat myself? Uh, I don't I'm trying to find the exact wording you were on. You can That's start okay. again. All right, let's start it again. Make sure it all got recorded properly. Okay. I'll start again. Um, look, I'm talking about the toilet block that's nearby to the corner of uh, Chapel Street and Dandenong Road. Um, and um, if I need to introduce myself again, my name's Sean Lancashire. I'm the Deputy Principal at St Mary's College in East St Kilda and Windsor. And um, we've put in place over the course of the last 10 to 15 years preventative measures to stop our students from having to walk past that toilet block. And I'm looking for some assurance from Council that there'll be more than um, a uh, investigation into what might be done about that toilet block and some commitment to actually demolishing the toilet block, given that there's, at least from my school, over 500 students who potentially walk past it every day that we have to put in place, as I said, for 10 to 15 years, preventative measures to stop them from walking past that toilet block, given the known concerns, danger and activity um, surrounding that toilet block. So I'm seeking some assurance from Council about that. Thank you, Sean. And just for the record, can I have your suburb? Uh, where I live, uh, I live in Airport West, but I work, obviously, as I said, in uh, East St Kilda. Yeah, and not a problem. Thank you very much. It's just for the record that I have to ask you that. Now, I'm going to refer to Lachlan Johnson, one of our officers, to answer your question. Lachlan? Thank you, Sean, for your question. Council has a number of older toilet blocks that are non-compliant to current SEPTED standards and expectations, of which this is one. Council is aware of the issues of these toilets. Uh, we do have occasional occurrences of vandalism, including people breaking in when the toilets are locked at night, graffiti and other things. We've also been made aware recently of the defensive measures that your school has put in place. The toilets have been listed in the draft public toilet plan for further investigation to identify the utilisation of the toilets, as we believe they are likely underutilised due to their location and having nearby toilets located in Alba Park that are currently being reconstructed. We have recently started trialling smart technology sensors that can provide utilisation data. We can confirm that they will be expanding this trial and will be installing the sensors in this toilet as a priority to help inform the next steps with this facility. Should the investigation suggest that these toilets are underutilised, Council will seek to close the toilets deeming them not required. If the investigation suggests the toilets are required, Council will include planning feasibil and feasibility to upgrade the facility to a septed compliant building. I'm off. Thank you very much. I call upon Rowena Fitzgerald submitting a question to Council. Rowena, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Please say your name, suburb, and you have two minutes. Sure, I won't take two minutes, but thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Rowena Fitzgerald, and I live in St Kilda West. Um, and my question tonight relates to um, the proposed toilet block outside of St Kilda Park Primary School. Um, I'm the mother of a child that attends St Kilda Park Primary School. Um, next year I'll have two children there. And my question is um, to Council, why are you considering investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in creating a new toilet right outside of primary school when there is already a public toilet facility located very close by in the Metropole building? Um, and could Council provide us with some information as to why the public toilets that were located here were close to the public um, and confirm whether public safety concerns were one of the issues considered in making that decision? Thank you. Thank you, Rowena. Now, before I call on an officer, do we have David Williams online? Still no. Okay. Then I'll call upon Lachlan Johnson to provide a response, please. Thank you, Rowena, for your question. Um, a detailed assessment of these issues was considered by Council in, on 15 June 2020. As outlined in that Council report, Council had previously had an agreement with the Metropole, which was entered into in 2014-15, to provide public toilets to service Fitzroy Street. Public safety concerns were raised in late 2016. A public safety audit was completed on the Metropole toilets, which recommended their closure, primarily due to the lack of passive visual surveillance at the site. As a result, the licence was not renewed, and since that time there's been no public toilet provision along Fitzroy Street. Thank you. All right, one more. We have, I call upon Martin Skin submitting a question to Council. Martin, can you hear us? Here in Council, this is Martin Skin from Port Melbourne. Uh, I have a question. Uh... Are you still there? It seems to have cut out a little bit. Martin, if you can just keep talking, we'll see if we can hear you. Nothing yet. You can hear him there, but not in the auditorium. Okay. Um, yes, I have your question here. So if you could, if we can't get him back, you can keep trying talking. And as soon as we hear you come back on, we'll switch to you. But in the meantime, we have your question here, and I'm going to ask the head of governance to read it out on your behalf. Through you, Mayor, this question was submitted by Martin Skin. The State Government briefed residents around Gasworks Park on 31 May about a new school arts centre project at corner of Pickles and Richardson Streets. The presenters told, presenters told us that parking problems would be handled by the Council. Um, yeah, the other uh, comments I would just add to that is, is um, it would be better if uh, we could get earlier briefings about these things because the construction has just started. Uh, Martin, you've just... Yes, I'm really sorry. We're having a bit of issues with the speakers in the auditorium that we're sitting in. So you've just come in. Like I'm now hearing you again after you introduce yourself. Do you want to start again from the beginning? Oh, this is a bit painful, isn't it? Very sorry, everyone. All right. It's still having issues, so I'm going to have Xavier finish it off. I'm really sorry, Martin, that it's um, been a problem on our end. Through you, Mayor. The State Government briefed residents around Gasworks Park on 31 May about a new school arts centre project at corner of Pickles and Richardson Streets. The presenters told us that the parking problems would be handled by the Council. About 60 locals attended and over half were concerned about parking and traffic. We were all supporters of the arts, but only at a reasonable cost. Can the City of Port Phillip Council please guarantee that there will be free and generous local permit, per permit parking for all residents within 500 metres of the new building for the next 30 years? Can the City of Port Phillip Council ask the State Government to provide much earlier briefings to residents about future works in their areas? In this case, the 31 May presentation was only a few days before the construction phase of the project starts. We were only allowed to ask questions for about 10 minutes. Can Council negotiate for local residents to get well-discounted tickets to show at the Arts Centre? Can the Council ensure the project pays attention to the risk of the large gasworks wall collapsing? as happened in Carlton on 28 March 2013, killing two people. Thanks in anticipation. Thank you for the question, Martin. I'll ask Brian T to respond. 
I'll just uh, request uh, Natalie responds on my behalf. Oh, sorry. Natalie, please. Thank you, through you, Mayor. Thank you, Martin, for your question. The Parking Management Policy 2020 guides how Council manages the changing on-street car parking needs of the community. This includes parking controls and the issuing of residential parking permits. We have limited on-street parking and the policy helps us balance the competing demands of residents, visitors and workers. Council policy needs to be flexible to adjust to changing community needs. We therefore cannot guarantee parking controls will stay the same for the next 30 years. Council will consider the appropriate parking settings on a case-by-case -case basis after consultation with impacted groups. In cases like these, we have a few options we can respond with, including providing time-restricted parking. This will restrict how long visitors can use parking and encourage parking turnover. Residents with residential parking permits are exempt from, time, from these time restrictions. The cost of parking permits are determined by Council as part of the budget process and any requests for exemptions to paying for permits are considered through exceptional circumstance processes. Council engages with the Victorian School Building Authority and will pass on concerns about the timely nature of the engagement on behalf of residents. Thank you. Thank you, Nellie. Now, we did have one more on my list that uh, we're not sure if it's a technical issue or not, so I'm going to ask the Head of Governance to read out the question and we'll get the response as well. Through you, Mayor, this question was submitted by David Williams. As representatives of St Kilda Park Primary School community, we are telling Council that the proposed public toilet in front of our school will adversely affect perceptions of safety as our children journey to and from school each day. Given this, how does Council expect to achieve its objectives in the Move, Connect, Live integrated transport strategy? These objectives aim to make it easier and safer for people to walk to and around activity centres, key public transport stops and other destinations in our city's neighbourhoods. How will Council achieve its plan for 10-minute neighbourhoods, which states an intention to, quote, implement walking priority and safety improvements on routes to schools? How does Council expect to achieve its aim to increase walking by 36% and bike riding by 151% if parents and children are already being attacked in Fitzroy Street? How will building this toilet improve the likelihood that we want our kids walking or riding to school? Thank you. Lachlan Johnson, are you able to respond to that one too? Thank you. Through you, Mayor. Uh, as I noted in my previous response, Council considered many of these issues in its 15 June 2020, 2022 meeting. Uh, Council has previously considered these particular concerns and resolved to continue with the delivery of the project. Officers are currently working to implement that decision. As outlined in detail in that June report, the proposed public toilet is septet designed to reduce the likelihood of antisocial behaviour to the greatest degree possible. It is not anticipated that the inclusion of a public toilet in this location will adversely impact active transport. Thank you. That concludes the public question and submissions time. We'll move on to councillor question time. Councillors, do you have any questions you would like to raise tonight that are outside of discussing any items on the agenda? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm wondering if officers could give an update on any discussions regarding funding commitments from the federal government for childcare uh, renewal in terms of asset renewals in the city, uh, particularly based on comments made uh, during the federal election by the local member, Josh Burns, in relation to potential commitments that could be made at the federal level uh, for childcare infrastructure within the city of Port Phillip. Laura <laughs> Belcar, can you answer that, please? Certainly. Through you, Mayor. Council submitted a budget submission in January this year requesting that the federal government contribute $10 million to the upgrading of our childcare centres over the next five years. A copy of this submission was provided to the federal member for McNamara, Josh Burns. Council requested federal funds to supplement state government funding and council investment for upgrades of our childcare centres, with all funds raised to go towards upgrading the buildings that early education and childcare are delivered from. Mr Burns did not make any commitment at the 2022 federal election for childcare funding, and no funding has been allocated in this year's federal budget. Whilst no direct financial commitments were made, Mr Burns did attend numerous community meetings and indicate strong public support for saving the centres, giving rise to expectations of federal support. Officers and the Mayor will be meeting with Mr Burns in July and will raise this issue accordingly. The results of those discussions will be reported back to councillors in due course. Thank you. Do you have any other questions, councillors? 
No. All right. We'll move on to sealing schedule. Councillors, we have no items for sealing on tonight's agenda. On to petitions and joint letters. Councillors, we have no petitions or joint letters on tonight's agenda. So we'll go on to reports. This is the presentation of reports. We're noting that items 13.1, which is councillor expenses April and May, 13.2, status of council decisions, and 13.3, records of informal meetings of councillors, will be moved on block, meaning we'll do one vote for the three of them. All right, the first one up is 9.1, Multicultural Advisory Committee, 2022 Annual Report. Are there any questions of the officers in relation to the report? I see none. Councillors, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Okay, Councillor Clark to move. Do we, and Councillor Baxter, Baxter a second. Councillor Clark, would you like to speak to it? Yes, thanks, Mayor. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to uh, commend this report. As a new member on the Multicultural Advisory Committee, uh, we are, I've been in a couple of meetings. I've got a lot more meetings uh, to attend and uh, enjoying my time on the committee. Uh, you can see from this report the breadth of what the Multicultural Advisory Committee gets involved with. Um, it's, it's quite a challenge uh, and they've got a great a group of experienced people and people who represent a wide cross-section of the community to be able to give uh, council a lot of sound uh, advice and thoughts around how we can make sure we're engaging with uh, as many of the multicultural committees and community members and groups that we uh, have out in our community. Uh, I particularly just wanted to uh, bring attention to, firstly, we have a new chair, Tanvi Moore, um, so welcome and congratulations to her who will be taking over from Georgina Salutis who uh, stepped down just recently as we all know and Helene uh, Kamoon remains as the Deputy Chair which is great. Uh, one of the key things you'll see in this report is the welcoming cities which is one of the key focus for the uh, advisory committee in helping the City of Port Phillip make sure we are as welcoming to all our multicultural communities and people across uh, Victoria. And the other thing of note uh, is that this week, this Saturday, June 24th, is Refugee Week. And we have a great series of um, um, programs uh, from two to four at the St Kilda Library. So I encourage everyone to come down and participate. Things like African drumming, uh, pop-up stalls and uh, Lotus Choir. So uh, it should be a great afternoon. And I wanted to... Um, thank the committee for all their work over the last year. Great, thank you. Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to it? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, just as the, as the outgoing um, Councillor Delegate to the uh, committee, I just wanted to congratulate and thank the uh, committee for their work to also congratulate Tanvi on the, um, on the appointment uh, as, the, as the chair. Um, the, the, this committee does amazing work on very little resourcing um, and is plays that really effective role as a connector between a lot of um, individuals and groups out in the community that are honestly in a lot of ways the ones that really make things happen in terms of diversity and inclusion uh, in this city um, despite the fact that it's you know one of the things we really want to support and push along the actual doing is is generally done by by volunteers on the ground and and wonderful people like in this committee so um, thank you very much for the for the work that you do thank you for your your commitment to um, uh, the the inclusion and social justice element of making sure that people are supported and protected and kept made made to feel safe and uh, and that the the council has their back. I know that I've had many conversations with um, many members of the committee, including the previous chair, Georgina, and with Tavi as well, about what more um, we can do, um, not just for multicultural uh, communities, but with um, disadvantaged communities and uh, all sorts of people who need help and assistance and uh, acceptance and love in this uh, in this city. So, um, just a great uh, just a great committee and. Well done. Thank you. Any other councillors want to speak to the item? If not, let's take that to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. 
All right, on to 10.1. This is the adoption of Community Amenity Local Law 2023. Are there any questions of the officers in relation to this report? No? Now, we have an officer's recommendation. Would someone like to move this or something different? Councillor Clark, what would you would you like to move the officer's rec or something else? I'd like to move an alt rec, please, okay. Mayor. You do, do you want me to read the whole thing? Uh, I know it gets lengthy. Maybe if you can explain the difference. Read the part that ah, might be different. So 3.6. Uh, so... The current clause uh, in the local laws for camping, a person must not camp on any council land or in a public place in a vehicle, tent, caravan or any other type of temporary or provisional form of accommodation. Uh, number two, a person is not guilty of an offence under subclause one where that person establishes that they are homeless or in need of secure accommodation or B, have complex needs or is in the need of assistance because of mental or physical disability or illness. Uh, the amended... Uh, yeah, amended clause 42, camping on council land. Uh, number one, a person must not camp on any council land or any public place in a vehicle, tent, caravan or any other type of temporary or provisional form of accommodation. Number two, a person is not guilty of an offence under subclause one where that person establishes they are homeless or in need of secure accommodation. Uh, the next section... Um, is about the process, so authorises commencement of a statutory process for the making of the proposed community amenity, uh, local law in accordance with community engagement policy. Uh, so it's about going to consultation and the last one authorises the publication of a notice pursuant to section 73.3, 73.4 of the Local Government Act by giving public notice in a newspaper on Council's website of its intention to make a community amendment of the local law. The notice will state the objectives and intended effect of the proposed local law and that a copy of the proposed local law is available for inspection at Council's office and Council's website and the community engagement process that applies in respect of making the local law. That's it. Thank you. Now, I think, I'll need a second before I ask questions on it because it's an amendment. All right, I'll look for a seconder. Councillor Sierkoff to second. Now, because this is new, if any councillors have uh, questions of the officers, that's open again as an opportunity. So I might start with one. So in this 3.8, it says, the notice will state the objectives and intended effect of the proposed local law. Now, is that in general, is it more specific to the change, the amendment? Is that just what we would normally do when we advertise about this, or is it more about only the amendment? Um, thank you. So the, for the question there, um, what the process that is outlined uh, in this uh, resolution is the process set out under the Local Government Act. It is more prescriptive than the engagement that we would usually um, participate in. There are uh, requirements, reasonably, reasonably strict or prescriptive requirements in terms of the nature of the material uh, that we put out and where um, that material um, is, um, how that material is promoted to the community, including through the local newspaper, but also in addition we'll put it through our, our um, Have Your Say page, but we'll also use other opportunities like libraries and so on to uh, promote opportunities for community engagement on this uh, proposal. Now, the second question would be, say this was supported and it went to community consultation. Uh, I guess to understand the process, when that would occur possibly, the cost and what, I know I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but what would be maybe the question that you're looking to consult on? What would be sort of the wording around it? Because this is one amendment to the local law, stand alone. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and the, we will need to work through the, the question, but essentially um, it will be to the uh, effect that uh, does the community um, support a change to the current uh, exemptions to the camping clause such that it will no longer be, uh, an individual will no longer be exempt from 
uh, prosecution under the illegal camping provision where that uh, individual um, has requires assistance uh, due to a medical or physical disability. The question will be in that framed in that realm and then there'll be supporting material to provide context for that question. Um, it will be a discreet engagement in the sense that um, in the sense that it will be different to the process that will be completed tonight if the local law is supported, which reviewed all of our local laws, suggested a number of changes, but also sought endorsement from the community for existing local laws without variation. This engagement will be uh, on, a, on this specific proposal uh, and this specific proposal alone. Uh, in terms of the uh, timing, Again, um, we council um, would would need to um, manage its resourcing implications, but um, the uh, work would take um, a number of weeks before we would commence our engagement process. However, if we are anticipating that there would be further changes that councillors would want to uh, address, it might be that we would delay that aspect of the engagement uh, to allow us to do uh, further engagement in relation to other matters should that arise in the short term. Uh, in terms of the costs, uh, the costs um, would be, uh, we would, re would, would be around, I, I don't have a, a definitive number, uh, but the most um, uh, expensive part of the element, of course, apart from council resourcing, uh, but the, the substantial cost would, would be for us to require legal advice because, it, because it's quite technical and prescriptive in terms of the language that we need to use and the process that we need to use. But we've just completed that process, so I, don't, I would anticipate that we would not require um, a significant additional budget in order to do that because we've just had the learnings of the process that, that we've just gone through. Thank you. I have two more questions. Sorry to hog it a bit at the beginning. But can you just clarify that? So this doesn't lock us in if this was supported. We, it would go out to community consultation. We'd come back and consider it. But we still have the local law the way it wouldn't affect no sunsetting issues, correct? That's correct. So the way that the, uh, the, this motion is, in essence, an addition to the existing uh, officer recommended motion, so that officer recommend, uh, recommended motion, uh, if that is approved, that will, um, um, that will enable or that by resolution council will then have a new local law. That local law will have the existing camping clause in it and that local law will then replace the local law that lapses on the 31st of August. Uh, okay. Irrespective of that, we will then commence the new local law process uh, in relation to the um, camping on council land. And then again, that engagement and the outcome of that engagement will come back uh, to council for council endorsement. And again, at, at council could then endorse that change uh, or indeed uh, not endorse the change um, when, the, when the matter comes back to council. Okay, last question. Are there, has this been past the legal team to know that are the people with complex needs or in need of additional assistance because of mental, physical, and disability and illness protected in a way that this is um, not protecting their rights? Um, the, um, we have asked for legal advice in terms of the requirements under the Local Government Act in terms of the um, process and the procedure to make sure that our local laws don't lapse on the 31st of August. Um, the question that effectively I think, Mayor, you're alluding to is the uh, Charter of Human Rights and does it infringe those provisions and as a council we are required to comply with all state government legislation including the Charter of Human Rights and Responsibilities and we haven't had an opportunity to um, uh, obtain that advice and I'm today but I, and, and I'm not sure whether we've obtained it previously um, and I might just check if Cindy Stubbs is online is able to provide advice in terms of whether we have obtained advice previously 
as to whether these provisions infringe the human rights legislation, Victorian human rights legislation, or indeed any other local government legislation. Cindy, are you available? Uh, yes, thank you, Brian. And through the Mayor, in uh, response to that question, we do have a Charter of Human Rights um, assessment, but it is based on the current Clause 42 camping on council land clause, not uh, the amended suggested clause. So with the advice, sorry everyone, is, just, is it inferred that we, this is a change that's significantly dropping out a group? So I'm just wondering if we're now infringing upon it. But if we don't have that, that assess oh, sorry. That assessment would need to be um, redone, but we can take that question on notice. Thank you. Now, sorry, I hogged the beginning. Any other questions that people have on this item and the agenda or the amendment? Yes, Councillor Crawford. Um, I, I, when we we actually have discussed this prior to going out for the current consultation, my memory is that it was not recommended by officers um, and it was to do with health and safety for officers. Can I, would I be able to get, seek clarification on one of the reasons that it was not recommended? If we, if we can remember that. Thank you. And, and Cindy, I might just see if I can ask you to um, supplement this question if, there, if there's anything else. Um, councillors, are, councillors are aware that uh, council amenity officers do um, uh, attend uh, camping and illegal camping. In fact, um, we, we're, we're working on that today. Um, we've got a situation where we are managing a, an illegal camp. Um, th those are difficult circumstances because um, uh, they can involve individuals who um, uh, can be violent and aggressive, um, and we need to manage that work carefully and, and, and rely on Vic Police support in terms of um, managing that um, um, relationship. So we manage the relationship with Vic Police to support us to implement this, um, and we work very hard to work on that. Um, what this change, the impact of this change, would be to mean that it is no longer an exemption for um, camping for people who need assistance because of a medical and, and a mental or physical uh, disability. Uh, and there may be circumstances where in um, approaching in a, an individual who does, particularly who's got an in, a, a medical, a, a, med, a mental, sorry, uh, disability where there might be an increased risk to council officers. Could I ask a follow-up yes, question? Yes, go ahead. But as far as I remember from the briefing, there is no um, council officers were not asking for this adjustment because it's not needed, obviously, um, for them to fulfil their duties, but also for their own um, mental, you know, psychological safety at work and, and physical. Because I, I don't remember them needing this in order to deliver on on their role. Well, there were concerns of officers that this kind of law would. Um, Adjustment in law would would have un, would have consequences. Is that Brian? Um, thank you, through you, Mayor. Um, this uh, amendment was this proposal was considered as part of the development of the um, local laws. It was provided as an option. Uh, it was not an option that was recommended by council officers. Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Niagri? Do you think there's a significant number of people who currently fall within this specific category um, who would no longer be covered and would be potentially fined were we to adopt this? Who's going to take that one? Derek, um, no. Through you, Mayor, <laughs> um, I'm unable to uh, quantify uh, the number of um, people that we have that are homeless in, um, in a precise sense, um, who, are, who do have a physical or mental disability or need support um, because of that. Um, however, um, um, you know, without having a kind of a medical 
background, but certainly the level of um, trauma that individuals who are sleeping in these circumstances would suggest, both through um, you know, life experience but also drug and alcohol, would indicate that some of them at least would have um, some uh, particularly medical, uh, mental disability. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, we'll move into debate. So I have uh, Councillor Clark has moved the amendment. Councillor Searcroft has seconded it. Councillor Clark, would you like to speak to it? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I'm moving this alt rec uh, to allow the community to have their input and say on any the potential uh, change for camping bylaws. Um, the local laws that we are voting on tonight uh, that it went out to consultation uh, did not have the camping laws included in them and the community didn't get their chance to give their views on that. I appreciate the officer's uh, perspective and the comments made. However, uh, the community needs to be able to give their views on some of the bylaws and the impacts for particular sections of our community. Uh, it's probably felt more around St Kilda um, than most other suburbs, but it's also in East St Kilda. Um, they feel this uh, um, intensely and uh, it's where they live and this is a law for all of the municipality or a potential law, but um, there are certain areas where we know where it's more impacted upon the community. Um, so that's the start of it. Many um, of my fellow councillors here attended a community uh, meeting that we had late in March, and we discussed all the potential changes, um, furniture, hoon laws, move-on laws, camping. Um, there was considerable um, interest and discussion around um, camping. Um, things such as hoon laws perhaps wasn't so focused on. So there is... Um, probably a heightened degree of community interest uh, around the camping. And um, this potential change, and all we're voting on tonight is to go to consultation, and I'm happy to see that the timing of this would be coincided with other consultation processes, so that would be um, the resourcing would be used from an efficiency point of view from council officers. But none of this gives uh, forces an officer to take any action if they don't feel the situation is, is safe or police aren't available. Um, but it gives them the opportunity to potentially use the bylaw if they so wish. It's in some ways, in many ways, it's no different to the furniture bylaw that we're voting on today or the nuisance law, that the officer has to decide whether it's safe to remove the furniture or whether it's safe um, to to provide a fine or some conversation around whether someone's um, causing a nuisance. All of those require officers' discretion and they have a decision to make to ensure that they feel safe when doing so. This is exactly the same with uh, the, the potential for this clause, that if someone is, um, an officer would use it when they felt it's safe and no one is suggesting we want them to put them in harm's way. Um, this uh, gives the community an opportunity to speak. Uh, as I said before, the change would allow the officer to respond to people who are, are camping or living on the street who are not deemed to be homeless and have a home. Now, when we talk about homes, we're not necessarily talking about you know, what we here may be um, blessed to have, but people have been given housing and people who are homeless can live on the street indefinitely. If you don't have a home and you're homeless, nothing about this change is going to change the fact that you can live on the street indefinitely and we have council officers and support um, to help them find a suitable home. Um, as I said, officers would make a decision and determination as to whether someone's homeless. They can go away and find out if that person is actually homeless or not before they take any action. It is a complex issue um, and all of these amenity safety uh, bylaws and considerations um, require officers. Um, and, and this just gives the officers, as I said, we're going to consultation, but if we're talking about what we're 
going to, it would potentially, if it did get changed, uh, give the officers another tool that they could potentially use when they felt safe and it was appropriate to be used. Um, like all of these laws, furniture, nuisance, they will use them as they see fit. That might be nothing for six months, it could be uh, multiple times. It's their decision. Um, and where, um, um, where someone has a safe home and is living on the street, um, this allows them to request that they cease living on the street. Um, we need as councillors to consider not only the people living on the street, who, as we said, are living in difficult or clearly having difficult circumstances, and we're very empathetic to that, and we have a lot of support programs for that. But we also need to live in the community, need to consider, sorry, the community who live in these streets, and these streets are their home, uh, and their views need to be heard, and this is about going to consultation so we can hear their views. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Serikoff, would you like to speak to it? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think what's been happening over the past uh, four years or so is that um, we've been kicking this can down the street um, where I think it was in uh, December 2019 there was a petition to council with something close to 2,000 signatures um, with residents were concerned about what's happening on our streets of safety. And that safety includes when we have people who are, uh, have complex needs and, that, and they need assistance. People want to feel safe um, when they go about their daily, daily uh, routine uh, jobs, whether that's taking kiddies to school or if they're, if they're just going for a walk or, or meeting up with friends for a uh, breakfast or a lunch on our high streets. And then kicking that um, can down the street also includes when we've had uh, two more engagements with the police on the issues of safety, um, and that it, or still including um, people camping on the street. We've had uh, two community consultations in this town hall. One was, I think, was in December 2021, and then we had another one earlier this year. The same issue keeps on being raised over and over again. And I just see that this is an opportunity um, when, we have, when we review our laws once every 10 years, that we do the job right, we do it proper. We, let, we have proper consultation with all the community on all the, on all the issues that they are facing. So it's not a case of just a few people who are who are complaining or concerned about this um, when, they, when they're, uh, you know, just going about their own business around their, in, their, in their own neighbourhood. This is a one in ten year opportunity along with the other laws and we can address it now and um, see how it, how, it, how it marries or it goes hand in hand with all the other laws um, and to get a good outcome for our local laws staff so they've got all the uh, levers to... Um, get a really good outcome, whether that be a good outcome for the residents, for a safer place to live, or a good outcome for those who are vulnerable and who, who, are, who, are, who need, they need help. They need to be um, put into the right care when they've got complex needs. We just can't keep on kicking this can down the street. So we've had, um, just recently we had the Vic Poll meeting in this building too with um, with uh, police from high ranking to those who are working on the street. And the, um, what we heard from them kind of gives you a feeling of, or a sense of, and the pe people who turned up to that meeting too, they, they want to be heard, they want something done, they don't want to be ignored anymore. So it's just not a few people who are, who are saying the same things over and over again. It's a whole community who want to be listened. And this includes the camping laws. And so I think that um, we, we've got this opportunity with, what the, uh, with this alt, alt rec that's been put, in, put up tonight to, um, you know, take, to have that proper consultation as we had consult, community consultation, consultation on the other uh, bylaws. And this would, I think, complete the picture for everyone to know that they've been heard. The, I think... Um, what we, what we aim to do is that we want to, we want to have a um, support, a creation of a livable, safer and healthier city 
by looking at the ways that the public and the private places, how they were impacted um, on the urban character, the local amenity and the fair enjoyment for everybody. Uh, this, would, this process would still uh, protect those persons who are truly homeless and vulnerable. If a person has housing, if a person has housing, officers and outreach services should be encouraging these pe those persons to utilise and maintain those existing housing. It's not, it, is not, it is not safe to allow people with confirmed complex needs to camp on, on our streets because they might, may fall prey to drug dealers and, and violent offenders. These are vulnerable people who should be given the right care and not just left on the street. For people, for instance, we've got a situation in Middle Park where people just go and give that person food and cigarettes and just let, let, her, let, that, let that person um, behave inappropriately or antisocial to people who are just going about their own, own ways. We had a situation recently um, on one of our high streets where near a school uh, people who have complex needs need to have, be given help so that they're, they're not continuing to um, cause issues just for people going about their own regular way. So I think this is an opportunity to see if people want something done about our camping laws and to help people get off the street who need complex needs. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this item? Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. Look, um, <clears throat> this issue of camping seems to be a very confused one because both residents and councillors who are pushing for this change seem to be thoroughly confused on what they mean by the term camping. They've often in used camping interchangeably with simply being present on the street while poor. Um, there are people who spend uh, their day on the street because often they have nowhere else to go. Um, those people are not camping. Yet somehow this change is being presented as a way to deal with those people. Bylaws should deal with behaviours rather than people's life situations. So if someone is engaging in a problematic behaviour, and it does happen, um, with regards to amenities, so whether that be someone who's causing problems on the street or whether it's someone who's dumping rubbish or whether what, whatever it is, by all means, let's have laws to manage that. If someone is simply making some people uncomfortable by just being publicly poor or in need of assistance, that is not an enforcement issue. We need to be able to retain carve-outs in our local laws to assist people rather than setting up this blunt dichotomy between the deserving real homeless and what some people would like to call fake homeless, which is largely an invented boogeyman with no basis in reality. Um, but it's, it's a way to attack um, really anybody, because you can say, well, that person's not a real homeless, they were offered housing. It's really difficult for anyone to tell whether that statement is true or not, but you've said it so that you can have a go at that person. The purpose of this prop proposed change seems to be an attempt to relitigate a political fight that was actually resolved some time ago. I fully expect it to fail yet again tonight, as most councillors, most experts and most members of our community feel that harsher local laws are not the answer to very complex social issues. Councillor Sirikoff has referred to kicking the can down the street as if Council, Victoria Police and Support Services are doing nothing. It's pretty base political slander to accuse people of doing nothing just because every expert in the field thinks your proposed solution won't work and in fact will make things worse. One day you may have point to of accept... Order. Point of order, Madam Mayor. Yes, point of order. What do you... Section 38.1.2. Yes. Which details that a councillor must withdraw any remark that is defamatory, indecent, and abusive, or <coughs> offensive in language. I would say a number of comments made then by uh, Councillor Baxter. You'll have Councilor to state which comments. Yeah. Councillor Pearl. Sorry. There is nothing sorry, in the local sorry. law that um, requires Baxter, me to do don't that. Uh, interrupt at the moment. But particularly the reference to slander, and uh, Councillor Sirikoff is completely inappropriate, and it would be very decent for the councillor to withdraw it. All right, Councillor, I'll ask you to withdraw or rather clarify your comment that is more respectful in the tone, so maybe just, just be very mindful of the way it may be received while making your point. Can I clarify whether you're asking me to withdraw or Sorry, simply I'm modify my you, language going forward? I'm asking you to clarify your comment. 
Uh, sure. I believe that a accusing people of doing nothing just because they're not doing what you want them to do is base political slander. I'm going to ask you to withdraw the remark and you can con keep continuing on the rest of you, your statements. Okay. I'm not, I'll withdraw it. I'm not entirely sure what, which part of it I'm being asked to withdraw, but I guess I'll withdraw the whole statement. But I will say, um, instead, uh, I'll, I'll make another statement that uh, it is an insult then to those people who are out there actually trying to make a difference and actually making that difference to be told that they're doing nothing or that they're kicking the can down the street just because your incredibly simplistic solution is not, not going to Point work. of order. Uh, fact of error. I, I was not uh, accusing anybody as outreach people or those people kicking the can down the road. I was making the point Sorry, that, Christina, that procedural uh, addressing this issue Christina, of Christina, you the need to take laws. direction from the chair. When you do a point of order, you need to say the item number. It's, it's Sorry, very annoying, but I maybe apologize. someone else you can help you. Uh, with, sorry, I shouldn't say it's annoying, but it, yeah, so you'll need to point order. 40.9 part, 49.3 part E. Thank you. Thank you. And that was when you were saying that you didn't. So error fact, can you f clarify what you did say? I was not accusing any of the outreach people of not doing their work. Uh, the point was that kicking the can down the road it was referring to the local laws and how we want to maybe readdress it. All right, you've had her clarify what she said, so you're going to have to use what that's saying and work I, around that. I think Councillor Surikoff is taking issue with something she thought I said rather than something I actually I, did say. I don't have the ability to go back and say exactly what she said and didn't say. Okay. So. Please just, as I've suggested, keep going. Okay, You've sure. had her clarify. I think one day certain councillors and certain members of the community may have to accept that constantly offering simplistic solutions to complex problems may make you feel better, but it doesn't help anyone. And those people that are actually out there helping people, making a difference, putting in the hard yards, and these incredibly complex issues that take years in some cases to resolve, they're the people making a difference while you sit around continually asking why debunked tactics haven't been explored further. Stop wasting our time. I'd like to remind everybody, all the councillors, th about the commitment to the code of conduct. And I ask you all to be mindful of the behaviour expected of councillors under the standards of the conduct. Councillors have the right to speak on any matter before council and thus not be interrupted. Councillors do not have the right to interject in debate. Point of order can be used, but let's make sure that we follow the rules that we abide by. Thank you. Now, Councillor Baxter, thank you. Now, anybody else like to speak to it? Councillor Nyagri? Thank you, Mayor. I'm also going to be voting against this. I think it's a, um, I mean, to put it simply, it's quite a cruel proposal, really. Um, what we are proposing to do here is, in order to solve um, issues on our streets, we are removing complex needs as a reason why somebody might be able to camp on a street, which means sleeping overnight, um, and instead uh, find them um, as a solution. And I just don't think that that is particularly compassionate. I don't think it's really grounded in the evidence about how we might resolve this particular issue. Um, and I don't think it'll work, because ultimately, if somebody's on our street for the reasons outlined in this particular clause in our local law, it's because they are, most, in most cases, um, have severe mental illness. They have drug addiction. They have a whole variety of complex needs, as the clause states. And to um, ask our local laws officers to go out there and find them and think that that will solve the problem is um, folly, because I don't think that will work. Um, but it's also like removing that protection of those people. These are vulnerable people who we should be thinking about um, in a compassionate lens and trying to find ways to support them. I completely disagree with our approach being um, kicking the can down the road. We are working very hard with police. Um, we have our local laws out there. We have a bunch of funding to support launch housing. We work with service providers. They are out there as well. 
Um, it's really difficult to get people off the street, but to assert that we are kicking the can down the road by not um, removing the protection of people with complex needs from sitting on our streets and camping on our streets, I think is completely wrong. We already have laws around assaulting people, around drinking on the street, around um, a variety of behaviours that we decide as a society is unaccept unacceptable. What we are talking about here is simply removing a protection for a group of people who are extremely vulnerable. I'm really keen to see this problem resolved. I was really glad to go along to the forum back in March. I've spoken to a lot of residents about these issues. I walk up and down Fitzroy Street and Ackland Street all the time. And I just don't see how this proposal does anything other than remove a very reasonable protection on a very vulnerable group. The fact that our officers don't support this should give those who are putting it forward some pause for thought. We've discussed it at length months ago. We decided not to go forward with it. And I hope that we don't go forward with it tonight because I think it is the wrong approach. Thank you. Anybody else speaking to this tonight? Councillor Bond? Um. Oh, try it again. Hopefully it's better now. Okay. Try it that way. Bit 50 50 on whether or not we consult on this, and that's not to say I may or may not support a change, um, but I will foreshadow that in the event this motion fails, I will move the original officer's recommendation. Um, just to speak to our local laws generally, because that is the subject of the motion here tonight. We seem to be concentrating on one small clause in, in those. Um, but I speak to lots of people in and around St Kilda, which is where a vast majority of our problems are, and many, many, many people have told me that Fitzroy Street and Ackland Street is much better than it was even 12 months ago, but much better than it was four, five, six years ago. And in my opinion, it is much better than it was four, five, six years ago. Um, and I remember what it was like back then and even further. We don't have those problems anymore. So what we are currently doing is working. I've said for 10 years, and you're all sick of hearing me say it, we have all the local laws we need. We don't need any more. The, the, we just need to apply the existing laws. Um, and use them wisely and with discretion at times. And if we do that, we can resolve many of the problems that are of concern to many people in our community. And I think the change in approach over the last two weeks, the change in the resourcing, um, the change in the tasking of our local laws has made a massive difference to Ackland Street. And Fitzroy Street is... I can't believe how good it is right now. Running in parallel from that, we have our, our councils put, I think it's about $4 million into a common ground facility on Wellington Street, which is tackling the issue of homelessness from the other side, where it's not just all about law enforcement, it's about finding a place to, for people to go where they... You know, the first step in getting help is having a roof over your head. We hear that again and again and again from the experts. And we're putting $4 million into a facility whereby we will put a roof over people's heads and then hopefully at some point in time they are able to take advantage of the, um, the health facilities available in that facility in Wellington Street. Our by name list, um, in May 2022... There were 96 people on our by name lift list. By May 2023, there were 55 people. That's a 45% reduction um, in people on our by name list. That's for those not aware at home. The by name list is the number of people either homeless, sleeping rough, um, at risk of homelessness, sleeping in cars, that sort of thing. We monitor them regularly, daily in some instances. We keep a list of who these people are, what agencies are dealing with them, um, what assistance they're getting, what offers of assistance they've had. So we, we are very much in touch with our homeless, rough sleeping, at risk of homeless community here in Port Phillip. And these tactics are, are working. This program and approach is working. It's gone from 95 
as I said, 96 down to 55 in 12 months, 45% reduction. And that's good news. I don't think we've made enough of that just quietly. We should be certainly shouting that from the rooftops. That you know, the approach we're taking is actually working here. And we're seeing that reflected in the number of people that we are seeing primarily sleeping on Aquin Street and Fitzroy Street. It is well down on where it was 12 months ago or two years ago. Um, we're not seeing the large numbers of people congregating and you know, some are caused problems, some are genuinely homeless. So that's certainly an approach that, that we can say is working. And if we, especially the, the change we've made in the last couple of months um, with, the, with our, um, the way our local laws are, are tasked and are reacting and working well with the police, you know, we are seeing it's working. It's, streets are never going to be perfect. You know, this is St Kilda. So if anyone thinks this is ever going to be Armadale or you know, even Middle Park, they're kidding themselves. You're living in the wrong suburb. That's never going to be St Kilda. But doesn't mean we have to accept bad behaviour. It doesn't mean we have to accept um, assaults and all the other things. We have ample laws to deal with them and you know, I'd love ample police to deal with all them. But you know, no new law, I don't think, is, re is required here. Um, one of the conversations I've had with a number of people is about move-on laws. I don't support move-on laws. Once again, we have all the laws we need to deal with observed antisocial behaviours, drinking laws, assault laws, you know, all those sorts of things. We don't need that um, in, our, in our local law. And I think the, the legal advice we got was that is um, illegal because it's replicating a state law, so we couldn't do that even if we wanted to. And we do need to accept that it is not illegal to be homeless. I would hate for us to be able to walk up to someone and say, well, you're homeless, we need to move you on. And I know there are some people who would love us to do that. The suggestions around special economic zones or something to stop people camping on Fitzroy Street, Ackland Street, Carlin Street were just not workable. They're just not workable and feasible solutions. So I don't agree with those. Um, but you know, I do think what we have in our law in our local law at present gives us everything we need. It gives our officers the discretion to, to deal with many of the behaviours and many of the problems we, we all observe if we go in and around St Kilda. Um, I'm, I'm satisfied that you know, we, this approach is working. We, we are heading in the right direction. And it's not just me, it's multiple people I speak to say, hey, you know, Fitzroy Street's much better, Ackland Street's much better, there's not as many people around. Not to say there aren't still problems around. They do exist, but um, as I said, I think what we're doing is working. We don't need additional laws here. I'm, I'm satisfied if we keep heading down the path we're heading down, we will certainly, um, we'll, we'll certainly make St Kilda a better place. We're never going to make it perfect. If anyone thinks, as I said, we're going to make it perfect, well, you're going to be very, very disappointed at, at some point in time. But we are doing our best. We are working with the police. Um, with what we have here, and I, as I said, I think what we're doing is working. The stats and the, the feedback I receive says what we're doing is is working here. So just to reiterate, if, if this fails, I'm not still not sure how I'll vote, whether I think we should consult on this or not, but if this does fail, I will move the officer's recommendation um, as is. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to this? Councillor Martin. I'll speak against the alt rec on what I consider to be moral, legal and practical grounds. Um, there's nothing more distressing than seeing someone who's got complex needs, who, has, who needs additional assistance with mental or physical disabilities or illnesses. And I've got two members of a relatively close relatives in my family who fit this category perfectly, and they've both led quite unfortunate lifestyles, and given the lifestyles they lead, if this local law was implemented in Port Phillip and they were in Port Phillip, they would fall foul of the law. So, try to be careful so I don't identify who I'm talking about, but uh, let, let's consider someone who's um, fallen into drug addiction in their teens, has been around for 20 years, has a residence, but spends a lot of time sleeping rough, um, who's six foot four and 15 stone, um, paranoid schizophrenic, um, has spent considerable time in psychiatric institutions, and they're on the streets of St Kilda. Um, they decide to doss down for the night on a park bench. Um, 
morally I would have grave concerns if the only recourse that anyone took was to go up to that person and say, if you don't move on, you find $100. I'm not sure what the reaction would be, but I think the reaction would probably be that the person who was making the request to move on could end up in the hospital system and the person who was asked to move on would be back into the criminal justice system again. So I see major practical reasons why we wouldn't do that. On legal grounds, again, if this relative of mine had the wherewithal to be able to fight any pink slip for $100, I think it would be very, very difficult to prove in a court of law that this person was actually physically able, was, was, <laughs> men mentally capable of making a decision to sleep rough, given that they're not mentally capable, the, the, the pink slippers, it, it's not relevant. They're not, they wouldn't be capable under the law of breaking that law. And on moral grounds, and as I've said, not only do we all find it very distressing to see these people um, in our own municipality and in others, but um, and yes, I can understand why many people in Port Phillip, and I can understand why Councillor Sirikoff and Councillor Clark would like to be able to do something to to support these people, but um, I, the moral solution is to find a way to get them immediate psychiatric help and get a roof over their heads and to return them back into society. And unfortunately, the laws in our states aren't fantastic at that. I've had to have members of my own family sectioned. It's extremely difficult to have a family member sectioned. You've got to be able to prove that they're, uh, they've got putting themselves or someone else in immediate danger. And if you cry wolf the first time and then you try and section them a second time, when you, when you report them to the department, they say, well, hang on. Last time we did this, we investigated and we found that your relative was capable. We're not going to come out this time. So it's a very, very difficult thing to do. So it's a matter perhaps for state governments to look at how can we provide um, proper psychological um, assistance for these people. Giving them a pink slip with a $100 fine on it is not the answer. What I do see on the streets of Port Phillip is our local laws office is doing an amazing job. A few weeks ago I was in Ackland Street, and I'll better be a bit careful again not to describe the circumstances, but someone had been sleeping rough, I'm not sure what the background was, and it, they weren't in a particularly good state of health, and I saw our local laws team work with them for about half an hour, I saw the police arrive, I saw the police do an outstanding job, and finally they were able to convince this person to move on and they took them off to find some sort of overnight supported accommodation. Our local laws team did a, a fantastic job using the current laws that we have here. And if we support this amendment, and I fully understand why the councillors are bringing it, because it's very, very distressing to see these people um, who have obvious, particularly when their, their, their issues are um, psychological, um, but if, if we support this law, um, yeah, um, we're not, we're not contributing to the mental health of these people. We're putting our officers at risk. Um, I, I don't believe we can implement it because if we then tried to, if someone appealed the, uh, the, the pink slip that they'd got for behaving in an inappropriate way when they weren't capable of their actions, that's not, that's, that's not going to wash. I think the local laws that we've currently got give us all the adequate tools that we, we need Councillor Bonds talked about how effective our local laws and our local laws officers have been in the last 12 months as we've seen the number of people on the Port Phillip Zero list drop. And yeah, I'm, I'd be very, very, very uncomfortable if we tried to implement something which, as I say, I don't believe is going to work on moral, legal or practical grounds. So I urge councillors not to support the amendment. Not that I'm not sympathetic to the reasons that the councillors are bringing it, but I believe the practical outcomes of this will be far worse than what we're seeing at the moment. And last but not least, I think we're probably giving the people of Port Phillip, if we did pass this law, 
we're giving them a false sense that we can really do something about this situation. We're, with the tools that we've got, we're doing a very good job. And if there are any tools that we require, they're tools under the Mental Health Act that allow us to help these people get better support more quickly so we can return them to society. And that's not something that we can do under the local laws of a municipal council. Thank you. Are there any councillors who want to speak to this item? Councillor Crawford? We did just do a consultation on our local laws, which went for, I don't know, three, four weeks. Um, plenty of opportunity for community feedback. So it's not about people and our community not being heard. And we've had lots of forums with the police and various, so communities being heard. And in that, people did express, even though there wasn't this specific uh, law, people did express concern around some um, uh, antisocial behaviour and, and various things like that. And of course, we acknowledge that those are ongoing issues and uh, work with the police, who are the, uh, the people to manage that particular situation and with all the outreach services to try and help people in... Um, in various vulnerable states to get the support and care they need. This local law was discussed before we went out and there was no support from officers. It was not recommended. The majority of us didn't support it, um, given that, as Councillor Bond has said, that uh, a lot of the things that, that kind of the intent of this is covered by the other laws, particularly the furniture one, which we are looking to introduce shortly tonight. And if there are concerns as expressed by the people, the actual solution is not another local law. The solution is getting people into supported care with the wraparound services. It is working with the police. It is dealing with people's vulnerability. That will get the outcome. And I think when community members were feeding back through the process where we just heard them, they actually want an outcome. They don't actually necessarily want another law. They just want an outcome. So I think it's disingenuous to say that it's about being heard. We just gave people the opportunity to be heard. And the logic of the motion suggests that if we go out, we should put out both sides to every argument. We should put one concept and then another and get people to consult on that. No, we're actually here to make decisions as a group. And we decided not to go out on that law, the majority of us. And therefore, um, we can't go out with two ideas on every and get consulting and then come back and decide. We put out a proposition, we hear from our community, and our community said, yes, they're concerned about some camping or antisocial behaviour, but let's look to what really works rather than make another law that changes nothing and gives people false hope. Now, I won't be supporting it for many reasons, but one, we actually just listened to our community and our majority of councillors did not support this going out to the community because there was still plenty of opportunity for them to be heard. I don't know that it's legal. I don't, we haven't got information at this point to know whether it's against the Charter of Human Rights. Um, so I would feel very uncomfortable suggesting our community and then coming back and finding it's not even legal. What a waste of time and money given we've just done a consultation. Um, our officers, it's, we also have a responsibility to our officers and not putting them in, in harm's way. Um, and the one I guess I wanted to talk about something um, it's a tool, Councillor Clark said, a tool that will change nothing. Now, I don't know if certain councillors have had a lot to do with people with mental illness. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but I, um, many years ago, had to care for someone, a friend, and I hadn't, although you can see it, but being up close and personal, can I just say, his friends, we all put money in to pay his rent to keep him in his flat because we didn't want him to end up on the street. But I can tell you, and he was in and out of the Alfred psych ward, and I can tell you now, if he'd been sleeping on the street, he was in no state to be able to understand anything um, and comprehend and deal with it. And this is someone our age, this is not... And it was complicated, and I helped take care of him with another couple of people for years, for years. And he's in a much better state now, I can tell you that. But it really gave me an insight into the complexity um, and the gaps in our system, which, you know, the state government has done a review, a royal commission into our mental health services, and there's a lot of improvement needed. 
So to suggest that a law like this is, and we would remove the complexity of those vulnerable people um, makes me feel very worried. What if it was my friend? And although you can say we wouldn't give them a, it's just giving discretion to the officers, to do what? If we can't get them into a home with supported services so they, to deal with their complexities, I don't know why we want to remove it because it's not going to solve the problem. Um, the other thing is, it's just a waste of money and time. We've just done this consultation. Imagine if we do this every time we come to an, an issue um, and we think, well, actually, even though you, the majority of you didn't vote it up, vote it up we're gonna, I want to bring it back. I mean, that's not a useful or particularly great governance for us as a uh, council to get there. So a waste of money it will not deliver the outcome or whatever outcome they, um, you think that might be achieved. It's actually the real solution is getting people into supported care, continuing to work with the police and outreach, outreach workers and all the fantastic um, organisations around here who look after vulnerable people. Um, but I think, and I mean, it is a waste of ratepayers' money that we talk about all the time. But I think the biggest thing for me is I don't want to be on a council without compassion. And by removing this particular cause, which I do not think is legal, we become a council without compassion. The complexity of mental health, I've seen it up, and I used to go and visit at the psych ward at the Alfred. It, it gives you a very different insight regularly to the needs and when people are in that state, I think this changes nothing. Let's, let's put more support into local laws offices. Let's more, like, work with the organisations. We've got more people into homes um, than we've ever done before, so let's continue down that path. And yes, amenity issues, well, you know, look to where we can address it, but let's put people first, and, it's, and that includes community members, but understanding that the complexity of vulnerability and, and all the various disabilities or um, illnesses that people may be suffering, why? Why would we want to do it without compassion? Thank you. Any of the councillors who haven't spoken yet like to speak to it? Not. I will. Um, Broadly, I'm very pleased with some of the local law clauses that we're introducing, so that's maybe being glanced over in this debate here, because if this passes, we won't be able to speak about the rest of them. Um, I understand and sympathise with the desire to see more improvement on our streets, um, wanting to throw everything at the problem. In it, or in this case, it's removing an exception. We did consult. Um, it's not that we didn't consult on camping, it's just that we consulted with both clauses in there. So when it's saying we have another tool to use, it feels a little misleading because all those tools are there and it's more about the discretion, the procedure, and how they're implemented. And we want to help them, but it's hard to know what, what can council do more. We, we've spoken, a lot of people have spoken tonight about the mental health and hospitals, that falls under the state government. So it's really hard to say, other than Common, uh, common Ground, which is a, another exciting project coming online that can be helpful in this. I do, though, possibly feel it would be good to support more community engagement on it because it's a learning opportunity and an opportunity to hear from our, our community on both sides. I think this would be hotly debated, as it has been tonight. Um, but I am concerned that this takes more time, resources, ratepayers' money, at a time that we want to deliver on a lot of other things. Now, I believe in general that our, our local laws are sufficient as they're written and they are appropriate, but at this point I am, I could be open to further consultation. It's, it's hard to not know what the cost is, if it's even legal, that part makes me a bit concerned, uh, especially because it's not something new and different. It's just removing a clause, and the, the clause that's being removed makes it where it's questionable whether it is still legal. But the conversation, if the community still thinks we're not doing enough, doesn't understand it, it could be a valuable opportunity to speak about it further. Any other one? Anybody else want to speak to it? Okay. Uh, Councillor Clark, would you like to close? Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. No, I think uh, more than enough has been uh, said on it. And uh, thank you to councillors for your comments. And, yeah, I urge you to vote for consultation for the community. Um, thank you. 
Thank you. We will now take this to the vote, and I do acknowledge that Councillor Bond has foreshadowed that he will move the officer's rec if it doesn't pass. So all those in favour? All those against? One, two, three, four, five. So it has failed. So now we're going to the substantive. Sorry, not substantive. Sorry, wrong way. The officer's recommendation. Sorry? Do we have that on div division? Sorry, I missed that bit. Yeah, okay. Councillor Clark has called division. Uh, all those in favour? Councillor Bond, Councillor Sierkoff, Councillor Consolo, Councillor Clark. All those against? Councillor Niagui, Councillor Pearl, Councillor Martin, Councillor Baxter, and Councillor Crawford. Thank you. So that has failed. Uh, we are going back to the officer's recommendation, as was in the public papers, with someone like, oh, Councillor Bond has asked to, said, said he will move it. Councillor Martin to second. I've run out of space. Okay, Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to it? Um, we've probably said enough about one particular section of the laws. Um, let's deal with some of the others. Um, you know, there's a, a little bit in this local law that deals with furniture that's on the street, so our local laws officers now have a little a little bit more clarity and a bit more ability to deal with some of the unsightly items and the uh, collections of, of furniture and things that appear on the street, which is great. Um, there's a change to local law that allows us to have fire bins or fire pits in open spaces. I didn't realise previously that that was illegal um, or against our local law. We can now do that. So, you know, some of these festivals we're having in the middle of winter, um, we can all stand round a fire pit and have a few drinks and, and feel a little bit warmer as we listen to music or watch whatever it is we watch. That's something that um, I didn't realise we couldn't do, but now we can. Um, there are a number of other changes in here, but I think we've all discussed a lot of them. Um, but yeah, urge my fellow councillors to support this. Thank you. Councillor Martin. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone who was involved in the consultation process and um, most of the consultation shows that nearly all of the proposed alterations to the local law have got quite considerable support out there. There are a couple that were close to 50-50. But, uh, yeah, firstly, thank everyone who was involved in the consultation process and your views were certainly listened to and discussed. Thank the council officers in preparing this document. It's a vast document. And last but not least, we as a group of councillors have had many debates and you've just heard in open forum a sample of some of the debates that we've, having, that we've had behind closed doors as we've tried to come to an understanding of what the, we as a group believe are the most appropriate local laws for the city of Port Phillip. So I think we've come to quite a reasonable midpoint where we've addressed most of the concerns that were raised. Not everyone's got everything that they wanted, but I believe that it's, I hate to use the word compromise, but we've certainly come to a, a reasonable midpoint in arriving at some local laws that will be accepted by our community and I encourage all councillors to support them. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to the officer's recommendation, the motion at hand? All right. A lot has been said. I'm also going to foreshadow there'll be a break after this. All right. All those, we'll take it to the vote. All those in favour? That's passed unanimous. Thank you. All right. I promise a break. Let's do a six minute break to 8.30, please. Still in the presentation of reports. We're on 10.2. Oh, that, that screen's a bit funny. Um, approach to the review of the Move, Connect, Live Integrated Transport Strategy. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Oh, Councillor Sierakoff. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have one question. Um, it's depending on which uh, document you're looking at. Uh, page 125 of the overall document or page 128 of the actual um, motion itself. And that is, can Council please provide some clarification around the, um, the intent of the political factor? Which officer would like to interact? Brian T. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mayor, and through you, Mayor, uh, there is a, a reference in the um, report that is before uh, Council uh, tonight dealing with uh, this matter, which does reference the, the, um, the um, political 
uh, landscape, as it were, that has changed. Um, what that uh, reference is is that the uh, in, in undertaking the review, one of the considerations is that um, the councillors that were elected um, and supported uh, and, and indeed endorsed the um, original um, strategy or proposal um, are not um, the uh, elected councillors um, who are reviewing the policy. So part of the review uh, is an opportunity for those new councillors who have been elected since the policy was endorsed uh, to have an opportunity to have input into the review and indeed to help frame uh, the review and indeed um, the outcomes um, of the review. Uh, it is not, as per our discussion, councillor, and a suggestion that uh, councillors take a political approach per se. It is, as I've uh, indicated, an opportunity for uh, new councillors to have an input into the um, in, into the review of the strategy, and that is a clear parameter that um, um, we are considering in developing and implementing this scope of the review. Thank you. CEO, would you like to add? Just for the avoidance of doubt, <clears throat> there's nothing in there that's meant to be judgmental about new councillors having different potentially priorities, and they could also have the similar priorities. There's nothing in there that's meant to be derogatory around um, political or political factors. It's just a matter of fact that there was a different group of councillors who made the policy, and there's a new group of councillors now who are considering and may have different priorities to those who, who set that policy. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, I'm looking for a mover. Anybody want to move this one? All right, without, I'll move. Okay. Consolo, then a seconder. Bond. Oops. All right, I'll reserve. Councillor Bond? No? Would anybody else like to speak to this item? Councillor Martin? Yeah, thank you to the officers for preparing the report. I note earlier today we had a speaker from the local bicycle users group who was quite passionate about separated bike lanes, and my council colleagues are probably sick of me sending them pictures of the separated bike lanes I see as I do on my travels in places other than the city of Port Phillip. So for people out there who want to be involved in the review of this process, when the opportunity comes along, if your passion is separated bike lanes or whatever other passion, here is your chance to make your views known, and we as councillors will be adding our own input and looking at the views of those people out there in the community. So great opportunity for everyone as the process moves forward to end up having your say and giving a very clear message to your elected councillors about what you'd like to see as this, process, as this policy develops. Councillor Baxter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've, I've been very conflicted on this um, particular uh, report um, and I may end up abstaining on it rather than uh, endorsing it. Um, the political changes that have been referred to um, by officers also reflect uh, just, just in general uh, a political change on council with respect to the approach to um, safe separated bike infrastructure. I won't go into uh, individual councillors and their views on things. What I will say is that the perception of this council is that while the previous council was pro-active um, uh, uh, transport and, and safe infrastructure and put out a plan that was broadly supported by the community, this council is not perceived to be um, pro that at all. In fact, this council is perceived as being anti-bike um, by most of the community. Uh, some people welcome that. Some people uh, really uh, think that that's a great thing because um, they see a car-centric uh, future for this incredibly dense inner city area, but um, I, I think most people actually have seen us go backwards on this. Most of the actions that we've said that we were going to progress in this plan um, have, have not gone ahead and this uh, report here is about watering those down to what we think might be a more reasonable um, set of actions that we think we can, can complete in, a, in, in the environment that we're in now. 
So part of me really wants to support that and say, uh, let's try and get done at least what we can get done. Um, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good and so on. You know, if there are people who are going to block a good thing happening, then maybe an okay thing can happen. Um, but we've heard um, from one person that's coming, I've also had many people contact me, um, that this report is seen as us giving up on uh, safe, separated bike infrastructure. Um, I acknowledge that not every street requires safe, separated bike infrastructure. There are different streets that require different treatments to make them safe. But um, we, we are stepping back from a lot of the ambition that we had uh, in, in this space, and uh, I do see this as a, as a watering down of that. So I don't think I can vote for this, uh, this report. Thank you, Mayor Speakers. Okay, Councillor Pearl. Thanks very much, Madam Mayor. I'm also going to abstain from this because I voted against it originally, so I feel like I, I might just um, abstain as opposed to uh, voting against it. It's, it. it's difficult to vote against or for a policy like this in some respects. Well, easy in others, but because it's the, the breadth of it is so large, it covers uh, a multitude of things, and there's some things here I deeply support, such as the uh, advancement of Metro Two the population, economy and social channels and probably artistic channels in the city of Melbourne moved east to west, west to east and it's about time we had another river crossing uh, as part of that and I'll keep on saying that till the cows come home. Uh, that's in, included in, in part of this policy which is a good thing. Uh, the bit that frustrates me the most is the lack of integration around the M1 freeway. We have 1.2 million cars roughly go along the border of our city every year and we, we, we don't really talk about it. It's not mentioned in this policy and we don't talk about it in an economic context. It's the defining border of our city. It's the reason the border's where it is. It's a huge economic impact uh, on our city and it also uh, brings a ginormous volume of traffic past our city and also into our city uh, and we seem to ignore that fact. The other thing in here is the um, frustration around the fact that we seem to be anti-car in some respects but then promoting cars through the sale of electric vehicles, uh, which from an environmental evidence-based point of view makes no sense. Uh, we should be encouraging the people to keep their petrol cars and run them into the ground as far as, we, as, as, far as those cars can possibly go, uh, because all the evidence indicates, generally speaking, if you've got a car that was built in the last 10 years in particular, uh, the fuel efficiency of that car way um, outweighs any benefit that an electric car would a new produced electric car uh, would produce. So it, it seems strange that we're anti-car in many respects, but then we're pro people having electric vehicles, which are prohibitively expensive at the moment, particularly for uh, middle class, middle income earners, and particularly low income earners. There's no way those people can afford those type of vehicles to get to work. Uh, and there's, it, it makes no sense from an evidence-based decision-making point of view you would do that. Uh, Councillor Bax is right. In many respects, we, we are now starting to uh, look like we're watering down our support for bike lanes, uh, and that's probably because the state government initiative around pop-up bike lanes went too far uh, for many people in our community, uh, and that probably has wound back the progress on bike lanes in our city for a very long time, and that's a, that's a sad thing. If, if we'd done it in a more orderly fashion, or the state government had done it in a more orderly fashion uh, with better communication and a bit more coordinated, we would be in um, better shape. But it's going to be difficult getting ambitious bike lanes through um, in the next, you know, unless we, we have a, a, a big state government of, with a lot of conviction and money, uh, and also this council having conviction. It, it's going to take a period of time to rebuild the relationship with our community on bike lanes. Uh, so I'll abstain from this one, but it's a, a ginormous policy. It's one of our linchpin um, policies in the council. It's... Um, an important one and it's uh, very large in its nature. Thank you. Councillor Nyagui. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll be voting against this. Um, I'm very happy for us to go out to consultation. I think there's a lot of really great stuff in the integrated transport strategy. I'm happy for us to review and I assume it will probably pass tonight. But I simply can't put my hand toward us watering down our commitment to bikes. 
Uh, it's been extremely frustrating since being elected to council to discover that um, there are elements on council and out in that community, um, a vocal minority in my view, who are aggressively um, anti any kind of improvements like the infrastructure. They are ignoring you know, the wishes of our broader community. They are ignoring really valid safety concerns um, and are ultimately putting our community at risk and setting us back as we densify. We simply cannot continue on the road we're going with the current number of cars. Um, as somebody who'd kind of criticised council while not on it about the rollout, I think there's definitely been an organisational capacity issue. Um, it's not a criticism of officers. I think there's been a lot of challenges in the ways that we roll out these projects. Um, and I know that there's definitely a real commitment among our staff to deliver the projects that we've committed to. And I hope that we can work over the next you know, few years to increase our capacity, to deliver projects on time, um, and to deliver what we committed to. Um, but I'm totally unhappy with the idea that we would step back. We've obviously failed to meet our targets in terms of those protected bike lanes. I think they are just essential. People tell me every day, all the time. It's just one of the few areas where when I speak to anyone in the community, they always say, well, why are we doing so little? Um, why have we rolled out so few bike lanes? Why is progress so difficult to achieve? Um, and I think a lot of that is to do with political will. And I'm not comfortable with signing up to anything other than full um, speed ahead. Thank you. Any further speakers to the item? No? All right, I'll close. Uh, this is an integrated plan, and that means we've got many networks that need to work together, uh, that when they work together, we contribute to livability, but of course some also compete for space within our municipality, and that's one of the challenges we have very... You know, we have a, a tight, dense inner city area. But we also have emerging uh, types of travel that I think since this was written, e-scooters definitely didn't, well, they were illegal at that time. Now they're in the trial slash acceptable phase. But e-scooters do use our bike network. So it's more forms of transport that we have to consider. Uh, I'm not sure if there'll be some other ones emerging in the future, but it's always changing the space, modernizing. Uh, but there's some things that we control and some things that we don't control. So we don't control the buses, the trams, and the potential trains, but we do control our roads and how those can be used in our footpaths, etc. So we have a big uh, space in this, and our community looks to us to get it right. I will be supporting this. I think it's important we do go to our community. I understand that there has been some revisions that people are not pleased to see, but if we don't get five votes to... Um, to pass it, since some people have mentioned abstaining or voting against, this will lapse, so we'll, it'll come back to us. So We'll go ahead and put it to the vote. And Sorry, clarifying, yes? Can I ask a clarifying question? If this does fail, which there's a chance it could, does that mean the policy lapses? Or just the update lapses? Well, it wouldn't go to consultation because, and we're not endorsing it. So I think that it would come back to officers. We have to look at it and see what us councillors in a briefing session want to see different, what we could support. Yeah? So you are supporting, you are endorsing what is written here in the, the motion saying to endorse it and to go to community consultation. Through you, Mayor, can I just yes, please? clarify? The policy expires in 2028. This is the mid-year review, so the policy will continue. So the existing policy question? would continue. Oh, sorry, could I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Uh, is there any legal requirement to review the policy at all? Who would like to answer that? It's a requirement in the policy. I don't anticipate that that would be a... Uh, it, it's not a legislative requirement. It's a council policy requirement to review it. We'll need to have a... If it fails tonight, we'll consider that and come back. Thanks. Okay. CEO, can you add some more context, please? Through you, <laughs> Mayor, Link, and uh, Mr T, or Brian T will um, clarify, but just for clarity, my, my understanding is that the policy or the strategy that's been developed is still current. What we're suggesting here is to look at doing a mid-term review, which was a commitment in the policy, 
it would be open if council did not make a decision tonight to move forward. The current policy would still apply, and you could come back and we could have a discussion around whether a, a mid-term review is required or not. Thank you. Any further clarifying questions? I've closed, so we'll now take it to the vote. All those in favour? One, two, three. All, oh, sorry, four. One, two, three, four. All those against? One, two, three. All those abstaining would be two. So, give me division a Division required and remind people they can change their votes for yes. a division. Okay, division. Uh, how's that pass? It doesn't pass. Okay, so uh, I'll say it failed. Now, division's been called by Councillor Bond. So, all those in favour? Bond, Sirikoff, Consolo, Clark. All those against? <laughs> Pearl, Nyagri, um, Baxter, and Crawford. So now we have an abstaining, and, and Peter Martin abstaining. So now we have four versus four, but the abstention makes it five. Do I? Because I don't, because the abstained. So it failed. Yep. No, fair enough. Yep, it failed. <laughs> yes. So it failed. All right, so to clarify, this uh, has failed and the current policy stands. We can decide whether we want to the review at all. So we'll have a discussion if it's going to come back in a briefing, etc. Thank you. Moving on. Let's get through the end of the meeting. On to 11.1, .1, establishment of a southeastern biodiversity network. Councillors, do you have any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Anybody hands up if you got a question? If not, I'm looking for a mover of this. Sorry, do you have a question? You are not keeping up. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pause, ask again. Are there any questions of, council, of officers in relation to this report? No. I'm looking for a mover of this or something else. Councillor Baxter to move. Councillor Martin to second. Councillor Baxter, would you like to speak to it? Uh, sure. Look, only to say that um, I'm glad that we're continuing to explore this. Um, I don't know that if this... If this came back again and asked for more time, I don't know that I would give it more time another time. But um, I understand that, uh, you know, it's complicated what we're, what we're asking officers to investigate here. So I'm hoping that we do get some recommendations and options very soon, though. Thank you. Councillor Martin, would you like to speak to it? Very keen for officers to investigate where we're going in this area and bring their recommendations back to us, and then we can make a, a more... Um, not a more formal decision, a more informed decision about where we'll go from there. Fantastic. Anybody else speaking to this item tonight? If not, let's take it to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Thank you, that's carried. Okay, last report, but we have more after that. So it's 12.1 uh, St Kilda Live Music Precinct Policy 2023-26. Councillors, do we have any questions of the officers in relation to this report? Is that a head scratch or a hand up? <laughs> All right. I don't see any questions. Would someone like to move this or something else? Councillor Bond to move. Councillor Pearl to second. Councillor Bond, would you like to speak to it? Um, thank you. I think it's fantastic that we've gotten to this place where we now have a, a policy to adopt. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I might have mentioned an event on Friday, but that'd be wonderful if I could mention an event on Friday, but I won't give the details, but um, yeah, probably already said too much. Um, this is a fantastic piece of work. Uh, everyone knows St Kilda is a wonderful, has a wonderful live music history. It's something that if we're not careful and we don't nurture it and look after it and put in place mechanisms to protect it, that it definitely could be lost at some point in time. Um, I know that when we first suggested this, there were lots of residents concerned that, oh, this was just going to mean open slather, live music, um, 
and the place was going to be unbearable. And the fact that no one even came along tonight to speak to any concerns whatsoever for this policy says we've probably done a very good job with how we've communicated it to to the community. Um, I think we saw here that there is overwhelming support for this policy in all the consultations we've done. Um, our, our local community are all or mostly very in favour of live music and our job as councillors for the period we're on council is to be the custodians of that, that live music um, history and ensure it goes forward and is able to thrive under a new um, regime that will allow it to thrive. Um, this, this doesn't mean it's open slather, like we very clearly explained in this policy. It's about bringing all the live music concerns um, into one area um, and with us as council be the, the people that oversee that, us be the decision makers, us be the um, body that decides what's reasonable and what, what isn't, and that both residents and venues all have one point of contact or one set of rules or one set of guidelines by which to to raise their concerns or run their venues, whatever the case may be. And you know, for those who haven't heard me speak about this before, I often cite example of a music venue in St Kilda where you know, a resident took me down there and said, um, what's, you know, they, they've got concerns with their, their permit, um, they're having issues can you come down and speak to them as a local council? And I went down there and, you know, before I went down there, I, I rang someone at council and said, oh, what's the problem with this venue? And they said, oh, we've got no problem. So I went down there, spoke to them, and it turns out it, it wasn't the council. Everything they'd done was fine with the council. It wasn't the EPA. Everything they'd done with the fine was fine with the EPA. Liquor licensing had no concerns. It was the police that had concerns with some of their activities. So this, this venue had, you know, satisfied the requirements of council, the EPA, liquor licensing, but weren't able to satisfy the police. So I think it's unreasonable that a business trying to operate a live music venue in, in, in and around St Kilda has to deal with so many different bodies, all of whom have different interpretations, all of whom have different rules and regulations and requirements, and still try and concentrate on the core business of them running a venue at the same time spending all their time and uh, money, often money, trying to resolve their live music compliance requirements. This will ensure that venues have one point of contact, which we're hoping will be the City of Port Phillip, um, and we're able to set reasonable standards and make reasonable decisions. And that once we make these decisions and once we give the, the guidance to these venues, they have one point of contact to deal with, and that will be, be us. They have the consistency of knowing exactly where they stand by not having to deal with four different agencies with four different rules, and they can get on with the business of running their live music venue and not have to deal with um, all the government agencies trying to tell them different rules and different things. So that's primarily why, we, why we're doing this, um, also to preserve St Kilda's live music culture, as I, as I indicated earlier. This is a probably one of the, one of the, uh, the better policies that we've brought here at the City of Port Phillip in my time, because it will can, if we get this right, have a lasting impact on our city and protect the live music in our, in our city in exactly the same way a heritage overlay over many of our suburbs protected those suburbs when they were introduced 20 and 30 and 40 years ago when we protected them. We're trying to do exactly the same thing here with our, with our live music uh, venues. So thank you to all the officers who did the hard work here. If this passes, I look forward to seeing you all on Friday. If not, we'll, we'll put it in the pile with that other policy and we'll have to revisit it and come back. But I'm fairly confident that there, this one won't be too controversial and we, this hopefully we'll get nine votes. And I urge my fellow councillors very, very strongly to, to support this and vote in favour. Thank you. Councillor Pearl, would you like Thanks, to... Thanks, Madam Mayor. If this does... Uh, only gets a good press release out there to further remind the community of Melbourne that St Kilda is the premier place for live music. That's a, a good outcome in itself. But this policy is much more extensive than that and it has a lot of parents to it. Uh, probably none less than Councillor Crawford when she was mayor pushed this very, very hard and a number of people have been pushing this very, very hard with uh, local politicians and also ensuring officers keep pursuing what is a very, very sound piece of policy and hopefully um, 
you know, makes the commitment to the live music industry that we're still in the business of live music. Uh, and what we need to do is get all those people from the north side of the Yarra uh, back into the southeast side of the Yarra and come down to St Kilda to ensure that 10, 20, 30 years from now, St Kilda is the live music capital of Melbourne and nowhere else. This policy helps do that. Um, very happy to vote for it. Thank you. Councillor Martin? Echo everything that my colleagues have said. I notice we haven't yet referred to the residents in the area, and I think the way that the policy has been put together and the discussions and the consultation have shown that not only are we making um, St Kilda con the continuing live music capital of Australia, but we're also making sure that our residents' needs have been taken into account as well, and the policy picks up on them as well. So, brilliant policy, well done to everyone involved. Looking forward to voting for it, and looking forward, Councillor Bond, to going to whatever's happening at this opening on, on Friday. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak? Councillor Nagri? We're very excited to support this and to have this adopted tonight. Um, we have an incredible history of live music in St Kilda and I think this policy and this precinct will enable us to protect it and um, maintain it, but also to grow it and make it vibrant for many, many years to come. Um, there's a lot of, um, as, as Councillor Pearl alluded, there's a lot of people who've put a lot of time into this. I'd certainly strongly, strongly um, thank the advocacy of Councillor Crawford, who's definitely one of the great arts advocates in our city. I'd also acknowledge Councillor Bond, who's also a very strong advocate for the community in St Kilda, um, and uh, many, many council officers who put a lot of energy into this work. I'm very excited to see how this rolls out over the, the coming period and see um, St Kilda remain an exciting live music destination. Thank you. Councillor Baxter? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, this is, this is great. This is basically one of our jobs on council is to take the really great things about our area and preserve and enhance them and take the sort of bad things about our area and reduce them and sort of get rid of them. But um, this, is, this is our job. This is, we, we know that live music is part of the DNA of, of um, the city of Port Phillip, um, particularly St Kilda, but also definitely other areas as well. And um, this, is, this is one way that we can recognise that and, uh, and, and empower that and uh, show that, that this is our culture and this is who we are. So very, very uh, happy to support this. Looking forward to the, um, to the launch event, which may or may not be on a day or time that's already been spoken about a number of times by a particular councillor. Thank you. Anybody else speaking to the item? All right, I'll just add that it's pretty exciting. 3.3 .3 says that council formally declares the St Kilda Live Music Precinct. That's a pretty big statement, pretty exciting that we're at this point. Uh, and I'd really like to thank uh, officers for all, that have, all the work that's gone into this and councillors have driven it along the way. I know there's a lot of work to still be done. So uh, thank you for the past work and for the future work. Uh, watch this space, it's pretty exciting. All right, Councillor Bond, do you want to close? Um, no, I think I'll thank my fellow councillors. It appears all or most are going to support this, so this is going to get through it. It is probably a, a, a well, I think we're the first in the state to do this. So it's, you know, which when we started off down this path about two years ago, it was a, we weren't really sure where we'd wind up. We weren't really sure how long it would take. Um, weren't really sure whether, whether we'd get state government support at the time, um, but it looks as though we're, we're going to get that. We've you know, we formally declare the, the live music precinct here tonight, which is a, a momentous occasion. Um, not sure whether we could put signs up. You are now entering the St Kilda live music precinct. We could take down all those nuclear free zone signs and put up the live music precinct signs um, to let people know that they're now entering the St Kilda live, live music precinct. It is, as I said, the first of the state. This will be, you know, wonderful and... You know, we now commence the planning work to enshrine this in the planning scheme um, because there is a whole heap of work that needs to, needs to be done here prior to this um, be, being embedded in our planning scheme and becoming um, part of our, our planning policy here at the City of Port Phillip. But this is, a, this is probably the, the, I don't know whether it's the, the peak of the policy where we, once we declared this, it's, you know, the work on the other side is, is about putting it into into the policy so you know congratulations to everyone who's who had this vision um, because it's not something I don't think any other council in the state's ever done this 
Um, lots of, and I think there's only one other council in Australia that's done this, and that's up in Brisbane. Um, so congratulations to those that had the foresight to, to suggest this a very, very long time ago, and um, here we are, a few years down the track. It's, it's probably a, a great night, and um, we'll celebrate it um, at a future date to be determined. Thank you. Let's take it to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. That is the end of the presentation of reports. But, we, oh, sorry, no, it's not. Sorry, we got to move the rest on block. Sorry, the, it's a little bit small in my paper. Councils, I now seek a mover for a motion that the remaining items be moved on block being 13.1, Councillor Expenses Monthly Reporting, April and May 2023. 13.2, Status of Council Decisions and Questions Taken on Notice, recording, rec recorded by Council. 1st of January to 31st of March 2023, and 13.3, records of informal meetings of council. All still very important. Thank you, Councillor Martin, to move this, and Councillor Sirikoff to second it. Is there any councillor who wants to speak for or against this motion? Councillor Martin, nothing. Councillor Sirikoff, no. All right, like I said, there's still a lot of work in here. It's all for the public record. It's great. Oh, sorry, Councillor Nyagli. Well, let me go finish. Uh, a lot of information there. It's on the public record if people would like to see it. Councillor Nyagli, would you like to speak to it? Just briefly, given um, I've obviously spent a bit of money on training in the last, um, in the May expense, I just wanted to say on the record here, and I'll obviously probably post it on Facebook as well, I've um, undertaken two bits of training since being elected. One is upcoming, one I just did recently. First one was for um, around the planning scheme, which I did through MAV, which was a really valuable Friday afternoon um, a couple of weeks ago. And I'll also be undertaking the Australian Institute of Company Directors course training um, in August, um, as a number of other councillors have done. Um, and I look forward to both of those, and I think they'll both um, enable me to be a better councillor um, in the city of Port Phillip. Thank you. All right, anybody else would like to add? For or against? Okay. To the vote, all those in favour? That's carried unanimous. Thank you. Now that's the end of presentation reports, we move on to notice of motions. Councillors, we have two notice of motions tonight. The one is in um, public meeting, one is in the, com uh, in the confidential meeting, so I'll mention more about it in the confidential matters. Item 14.1 is a motion raised by Councillor Baxter in relation to reaffirming commitment to the LGBTIQA plus community. Item 17.1, oh sorry, here, here's the explanation. Item 17.1 is a confidential motion raised by Councillor Pearl in relation to a potential acquisition. This item is confidential under Section 31 of the Local Government Act 2020 and therefore will be considered in a confidential section at tonight's agenda. Thank you. So 14.1. Is it, will you put it up there? Thank you. Do councils have any questions of the officers in regards to this proposed notice of motion? Oh, uh, sorry, Mayor, can I just note the, the change? There have been changes made to the... I'm being told that when you move it, you can. So let's take general questions and then you can move it and there's further questions. Okay. Yeah, does that help? Okay, sure. Okay, do councils have any questions of, of the officers in relation to this Notice of motion. It's a little bit backwards, but general questions right now? Okay. Councillor Baxter, would you like to move this motion sure, for something thank you, else? Mayor. So yes, I'll be I'll be moving something slightly different to what was published in the papers. It's up there on the screen. Um, I will note uh, two um, changes after a consultation with uh, fellow councillors. Um, one of them is to replace the words right wing. Uh, with far right in uh, uh, section two there, um, and in section three to um, just some minor uh, changes to um, one is to add Victorian to the Pride Centre because it is the Victorian Pride Centre, uh, and also to add Victoria Police to that list of stakeholders. So um, that is the uh, the the changes. So. I'll speak Thank to it you. once I'll I have a seconder. I'll look to see if there's a seconder. Councillor Niagui. I'm sorry, right in that wrong place. All right, Councillor Baxter, 
Would, you can speak to your motion. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, I, uh, I, I, first off, thank you to the councillors uh, for uh, the discussion that we had earlier today around some possible changes to the wording here. My intent is to make sure that there are as many councillors as possible that can vote for this, and I um, am more than happy to to um, give some ground so that we can come to that uh, consensus. So. Really what this, this motion is about is in relation to um, the unfortunate cancellation of uh, an event um, two weeks ago now, um, uh, which was a rainbow story time event which was targeted by uh, elements of very, very dangerous groups among the far right, including the National Socialist Network, um, which is uh, a, a recognised uh, very dangerous group. Um, I want to be really clear that uh, although I uh, disagreed with the CEO's um, reasoning on, on, on his decision, uh, I will never clash with the CEO on his responsibility to keep our staff safe and I absolutely respect um, his, his decision to do what he thought was the best thing to um, keep them safe. We may differ on that, but there is absolutely no question that the CEO uh, has his staff's well-being at the forefront of his mind at all times. So I want to make that clear, just in case there's any confusion there. Um, these groups uh, have been running a coordinated campaign for some time now, um, deliberately to disrupt uh, events for LGBTIQA plus um, people. Um, most of them relate to uh, council and library um, held uh, events, um, generally uh, for kids, but also other types of events as well. The tactics that uh, have been used by these groups include um, death threats, uh, bomb threats, um, various other threats of violence, sometimes actual violence if they do end up showing up. Uh, to these events to so-called protest them. Um, there is no political legitimacy to their behaviour and their actions. This is absolutely terrorism, um, th which is the pursuit of political aims by, by violent means. Um, I've received a... <coughs> pardon me. I've received a, a statement from the White Rose Society, which is a well-respected... Uh, group of um, anti-fascist researchers from around Australia. Um, their work has educated and informed the media, the public, community groups and parliament about extremism by documenting, exposing and countering the role and rise of fascism and neo-Nazism in Australia. Um, there's, a very, there's a very long statement here. I'm not going to read it out <laughs> in full, um, but I, I, I thank them for providing this information. Um, they have noted the, the, the current flashpoint surrounding um, uh, rainbow uh, story times. They've written this statement in support of uh, this motion. They note that the groups targeting these events, while often distinct, are, however, frequently interconnected via the online far-right conspiratorial milieu. Um, avowed white supremacists such as the National Socialist Network, a group with ties to convicted terrorists and or intercepted extremist acts, have instigated some of these events and attempted to infiltrate the online spaces of sovereign citizen groups like My, my Place, um, not My Space, <laughs> uh, My Place, in order to radicalise them further. These groups have documented connections um, via the surge in reactionary uh, Christian right politics with Christian nationalist rhetoric and biblical references frequently used as justification for their actions. Uh, this may come in the form of prophet-like pronouncements from leaders within the various groups or in the case of Christian Lives Matter, a general militant obligation to defend their faith from the perceived attacks that social progress presents. So this, um, this, this, this has been documented and noted uh, phenomenon. It's been increasing over the last couple of years, partly in uh, in concert with and uh, and in response to the pandemic, <coughs> and as um, uh, public health measures have been taken uh, with regards to the pandemic, uh, groups that have uh, protested those have have, have often had um, links with these groups as well. 
So recently, the, the campaigning has escalated to organise attendance at council meetings in an effort to disrupt their proceedings, force changes, or sow distrust in the process of democracy itself. Some councils have cancelled events, such as ours, uh, at the mere suggestion by the National Socialist Network that they would attend. Um, the White Rose Society contends that this only emboldens such groups. Uh, who have revelled in the idea that they can shut down an event just by mentioning it, and that's part of we we've seen some of their internal communications that uh, have shown that that uh, that revelling, um, even if they had no intentional capacity to actually attend it. Um, really, what we're talking about here is: do queer people in the city of Port Phillip have the right to? go and attend events and be safe? Do our library staff have the right to feel safe running events for our LGBTIQA plus uh, community? If the answer is yes, they have that right, then why, why are we not doing everything we can to facilitate that? What is missing here? And I think this is really what, what this motion is about, is what is that gap? How can we fill that gap? We don't necessarily have to flagellate ourselves for, for years about the fact that there ha we've, we've failed here. We can look at it, take lessons from it, and learn how we can actually make safe spaces for people going forward. It is completely unacceptable that we would have a situation where we would routinely have events cancelled at the mere threat of violence by, by the, um, these terrorists. Uh, People need these events. Kids need these events. Young people need these events. They need to be able to understand that there are different types of families out there, there are different ways of living, that they themselves, who might feel confused in their gender identity or their sexuality, can feel accepted regardless of, of their confusion and how they might feel about that. We can't do that important work of affirming and taking care of these people if this disruption continues. So. I urge my fellow councillors to um, support this motion. It's in a couple of parts. We want to reaffirm our commitment to the inclusion of LGBTIQA plus people in our community. That perception of Port Phillip as being a place for everyone, and particularly one that takes seriously our responsibilities to marginalised communities such as LGBTIQA plus communities, has taken a bit of a hit, and we need to repair that. The second part is to condemn the actions very clearly of people who have caused this damage uh, and make no bones about whether or not they might be right or wrong. They are wrong in every single way threatening to kill kids at events because you don't like what they're doing, um, that's, not, that's not acceptable. And part three is to work with other key partners, not just in a, reaction, in, in, in a, in a reactive sort of way of, oh, we'll run events and we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can make them safe. No, let's make a plan about how we can deliver events safely because we have to. And then, of course, to report back on how we're going to do that. So I commend the motion to you, councillors, and uh, I hope you'll support it. Thank you, Councillor Baxter. Councillor Nyagui, would you like to speak to it? Uh, I thank Councillor Baxter for bringing this motion forward tonight, and I'm really excited to second it. Um, but I'm not excited to be, I guess, having to debate this topic it was funny, I sort of, two days before I was elected to council, I was in Calgary with my boyfriend at his parents' house and his mother was telling me about going to a protest, um, a counter-protest against um, a bunch of protesters who were protesting against drag story time there in Canada. And I kind of laughed at the time and sort of said, um, you know, <laughs> sort of sad that that's happening in Canada. I'm so lucky that that's not a reality in Australia. It's not something that we're seeing here, that kind of... Um, homophobia, that kind of political violence isn't part of our culture. Um, and so it was pretty gutting to go through what happened two weeks ago. Um, in the space of only 48 hours, we went from discussing these events as a council of group to having them cancelled. And I have only um, 
felt you know, kind of a pit in my stomach when I think about it. And I've um, heard from many people I've spoken to in the community that they feel something similar. There's a real feeling that we've you know, gone through a long process of stepping forward on these issues and we're suddenly finding that, that a very vocal and um, hateful minority are able to hijack what are ultimately very innocent and positive events and, and prevent them from going ahead. Um, the thing about drag story time is, to me, it, it's, it's about um, enabling queer culture to be um, celebrated, to be part of child t story times in the way that we have fairies, we have all kinds of different things that are part of the activities when you're a kid. And it shows to young people that, that that's okay to be different, that it's okay to be um, queer, um, and that um, difference is, is something that we celebrate. And um, the assertion that, that a, a drag queen is, is a pedophile, that they are harming children, that that culture is dangerous in some way or unacceptable is really um, not, I think, what most people in society have now decided it is the way <laughs> we think um, and is really scary um, because um, we've had a lot of really difficult conversations on these topics in the recent years and the majority of our society, thank God, have decided that um, our community should be treated equally, that we should be respected, that we should be part of um, the wider society. And it's frustrating when we have to try to run events secretly um, because it sort of sends a message to these groups that there's something to hide, and I don't think that's necessarily the case at all. Um, but the actions of very few are hijacking what is otherwise a really positive thing to do. I was really excited to go along to the pop-up uh, event the other week with Councillor Crawford and Baxter um, and to see in action a um, really positive event with a bunch of kids and four interesting stories being read. And, you know, that um, drag queen, I've seen him at many other events in the gay community, some that definitely are um, adult-only events, but the thing was ultimately... Dean is a, is a talented and incredible performer who's able to obviously target his content to children and target it in a way that is appropriate, that is sensitive and clever and thoughtful. Um, and it was so special to be at that event. Unfortunately, it rained, but the event went on nonetheless, and it went on without hitch. And I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves. How can we um, have these events go without hitch? Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done at council, and that's the name of this motion, is to have council officers go away and work with important stakeholders um, and find ways to prevent these events from being cancelled in the future because it's just unacceptable to me that we would cancel an event like this because of threats of political violence, because of death threats toward children. That's simply not the way we as a society should make these kind of decisions. Um, and it's incumbent on all of us, and I single out the police in particular, who I think have a massive responsibility here to step up, and I don't feel are doing enough at the moment um, to enable us to run these events. Finally, I would just ask my colleagues to put to one side their disagreement about whether council um, should be the provider of such events. That is not what we are debating here tonight. What we are debating here tonight is whether it is OK for a small group of very hateful people to threaten children and prevent events from going ahead. Um, if you're not in favour of council funding drag story time, that is completely up to you, and I would never, ever suggest that that was a homophobic position. That is a totally different thing, and I'm happy to debate that another time. But I think if you're unable to stand with us and condemn this kind of political violence, then I have deep, deep concerns for this council. Uh, and I'd suggest that um, you won't be very welcome at Pride because... Um, we, as a community, need allies who are going to stand with us on good days, but also stand with us on bad days. And when we are being threatened, when our entire existence is coming into question, we need allies who are going to stand up and say, that is absolutely not OK. We will never, ever accept a society where decisions are made through political violence. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak to the item? Councillor Martin. Firstly, I thank Councillor Baxter for taking on the recommendation of some of his council colleagues, and I think the, uh, the motion in its current form is a far better representation of what I believe, hopefully all of us, but certainly most of us would believe is an appropriate way of expressing our concern. It um, brings back memories of when I was... I'm probably the only person here old enough to remember what was like, life was like in the 60s in what's now the city of Port Phillip. 
to be a young schoolboy at a school where people had views about what my sexuality was and the harassment and the bullying that I received then. And it's been wonderful to know the last 40 or 50 years. We haven't seen those sorts of things. And now if we're seen as condoning or um, ignoring the behaviour that we thought had all died way back in, in the 60s, then we, we're, every, every time we ignore it or um, react by cancelling events, we're actually encouraging these people, and I, I really, really hope we never get back to the bad old days of what it was like when I was a, a, a young lad growing up in a, in a society which was quite homophobic. It was not, not a very pleasant place to be in the city of Port Phillip in those days. And as for, as for the adults and the assaults that just happened on weekends in St Kilda of people who weren't considered to be the same as some other people. It was a terrible time and I'm just really glad that none of you are old enough to remember what it was like. So if we can show that we're not going to bow down to the people who are behaving in, in, in the ways that Councillor Baxter and Councillor Niagi have uh, argued, then we're sending a clear message that uh, we won't be cowed by them and they'll go off and they'll find something else to do and they'll and society will be far better for that. If we're seen as reacting to them and moving our events, changing the way that we operate, then we're encouraging them and their movement may grow, may grow larger and we're going to turn the clock back 60 years, which would be disastrous. I was in Canberra last week at the National Mayor's Conference. Thank you, Councillor Consolo, for allowing me to represent you. And there was a very strong group of people representing a group called Rainbow Local Government, and I had a long chat to them. And people from around Australia a number of councils had already dealt with the issue that we had to deal with two weeks ago and they provided me with quite a deal of information which I've referred back to council officers about ways that council can go about preparing these organisations, all the preparation we can do, safety plans, the way that our comms would work so that our CEO is not put in the position that he was put in two weeks ago and I, I really felt for our CEO who I, I know felt very uncomfortable in doing what he had to do but given that that's how we he was looking after his staff safety. Um, you have to do what you've got to do when you're sitting in the, in, in, in the big chair. So, Chris, I really, really felt for you the other two weeks ago, and I know that you and Alison tried to make the best of a very, very awkward situation. I hope that next year, with the actions that we take through this motion and through lots of other people who support us, you'll never be put in that situation again, and the events that um, we wanted to run two weeks ago can run smoothly. And I'd really, really encourage my nine, sorry, eight colleagues plus myself to support Councillor Baxter's motion and send a very, very clear message. The pressure that we were put under two weeks ago was wrong. We'll make sure that if we're ever put under that pressure again, we'll have a better way of responding to it. And that we've got a timeline for getting our plans ready. So before we ever do this again, we'll have some action plans that will make sure that our poor, not our poor, our wonderful um, senior leadership team is not put in the situation they were where they had to make decisions that I think we all felt uncomfortable with, but I fully understand why they had to make them. Thank you. Who would like to speak to it now? Councillor Crawford. I'll keep it fairly short and sweet. Um, it was great at the pop-up drag story time. I hadn't heard Frocodile and My Shadow is Pink. I hadn't heard those books before, which was pretty um, fabulous. So I'm, I'm very supportive of this motion. Um, we cannot let hate win. Uh, and um, we need to find ways to hold events like this, um, inclusive events, and safely for our officers, for our community, for councillors. Um, I mean, I simply just want to say I am an ally of the LGBTIQ plus community, full stop, um, and I'm here to stand by you. Thank you. Anybody else speaking to this item? Otherwise, I will. Uh, I affirm my commitment in being an ally of the LGBTIQA plus community as well. I think it's very important. I think that statement you made about standing in the good times and the bad times was very impactful. Uh, I'm not a fan of labelling. That is something that I, I don't feel as comfortable with. I would prefer to focus on behaviours, and what we have seen has been awful, and so I definitely cannot support those behaviours. I condemn them. Um, now, it's, it's a bit hard on this one because... If this was a notice of motion just out of the blue, 100%, great. 
because it follows what just happened, it's, it's a bit more challenging because I know we have people who have a wide range of views on drag story time. And that is um, challenging. I think some people are misinformed, don't know. And then there are these extreme things that happen out of um, the behaviors, the threats, all that. That's horrible. But there were some people who just think, that's not for me. I wouldn't take my children that. I'm not comfortable with it. And it, because this sits right behind it, it makes it feel like we're now labeling all of them these far right. Now, there's views. I'm saying there's a range on them. Um, because none of the other events were really targeted. There's been a lot of events that have been programmed and not an issue. So I think it's great to see that we still have had events go forward. Um, my point is I'm not tolerant of the, um, the behaviors. I think it's horrible. And I stand by the LGBTQ A plus, the rainbow community. There we go. It's safer to use. Um, so I will be supporting this tonight. I would prefer a different wording that didn't have the labeling in there. Um, I also do, though, condemn, or maybe that's a very strong word. I fear that people are going to use the way people vote on this tonight as an opportunity to say who's for and who's not, who's against the community. And it goes more than that because this is a certain wording and if people don't feel comfortable with the way the labeling and all that, it doesn't mean that they don't support the community and it's really hard that starts getting vilifying counselors, for example, for um, the way this goes. Because I'm, I'm certain we have a lot of support among our counselors, far, far majority of it. And it's important that we want to protect our community. Uh, so it's, it's probably the difficulty around the labeling that may be a bit problem on this one. So like I said, I will be voting for it. And I do hope that people can show their support by affirming their support for our community. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to it? If not, we'll take it to the vote. Oh, could I close? Pardon? Oh, sorry. Thank you. You were really spot on keeping me on track tonight. Thank you. Yes, Councillor bon uh, Baxter, can you, would you like to close? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Look, I, I, I would like to close, um, and I think uh, um, the councillors who have spoken uh, in support, and, um, and I do understand some concern about people who might have different, different views about how you run these events or what the content of events and all that sort of stuff. They might be concerned about being lumped in with literal Nazis who are threatening to, to kill kids. I, I understand that concern. I, I feel like this wording change has made it really clear who we're talking about here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to run around calling people homophobes unless they engage in homophobic activity, right? So, um, but uh, hopefully this, will, this, this wording change will make it clear and we can get... Um, unanimous uh, uh, vote here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about these events. So I, I, I grew up in Dandenong. I, uh, I didn't grow up in, in, a, in, a, in a progressive, cool, edgy sort of area. I grew up in um, an area that at the time was a bit rough. Dandenong was really nice now. But um, uh, I had never come across an environment where anyone was encouraged to... Um, no one was told it was it was okay to be gay, or no one was told it was bad necessarily by any authority figure. Certainly in the playground, <laughs> you were told that um, that it was bad to be gay, or, or gay was simply used as a as a just a word for any old bad thing. That that sort of thing lasts for a pretty long time, actually, when you grow up in that sort of environment, and even. Later on, when you know, when when I've I've lived in the sort of St Kilda East or Balaclava area for a really long time and gotten involved in progressive politics and done all that sort of stuff, I, d I didn't come out as bi until I was in my mid thirties. It's not because the environment that I'm in now wasn't safe enough to do that. It's because the environment I grew up in has that much of an impact for your whole life, really. Nobody, nobody, nobody beat me for wearing women's clothes or anything like that. I don't have any story to tell like that. I, I had a pretty conventional childhood. But this is, 
these, these events are about showing kids, you know what, if, if you are different, that's great. Go for it. That crocodile story, you know, I, I did, I, look, I teared up on all of the books, to be honest, but that one was just a, a, a wonderful story about uh, a crocodile who was really worried about getting caught wearing clothes that the other crocodiles didn't think they should be wearing. And I just think that that's a wonderful message to send to the kids that in the end that crocodile's dad was totally okay with it and was really, really supportive. Um, that's not, that's obviously not always going to be the case with everybody's family, but that's what we should be aspiring to. And I think that the Community Angels Run event, the illegal event that went ahead on the, um, on the lawn, um, that I don't think was no enforcement action <laughs> has been taken or will be taken about that, but um, that, that going ahead and seeing those kids there, quite a few families turned up, um, engaging with that and also doing what kids do, like completely ignoring the story reader like they would at any story time, you know. Um, that was just really, really heartwarming and, and I, I, I want to thank the Community Angels for putting in that effort to put together that event where people could feel so safe and so supported even as they're being rained on <laughs> to, to hear these stories. Um, I want also to, to thank uh, Sean Mulcahy um, and, and Claire uh, who came and, and, and spoke to give their perspectives on this uh, and to all of the other community members who have gotten in touch with me over this who have felt um, upset, uh, in, some, in some cases betrayed, um, in some cases hopeful that we can do better. Um, Thank you all for, for making your voices heard and uh, let's do this better next time. Thank you for closing. All right, we'll put that to the vote. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those against? And some people are abstaining, so that passes. Thank you. Now. Uh, division. Uh, okay. All those in favor? Bond, Sirikoff, Niagui, Consolo, Martin, Baxter, Crawford. All those against? Those abstaining? Pearl and Clark. Thank you. That passes. All right. On to reports by councillor delegates. Councillors, do we have any reports from councillor delegates that need to be heard tonight? Oh, Madam Mayor, can I foreshadow at some stage I'll bring a report to Council on the Mayor's National Conference from last week, but I don't think tonight's the time to do that. Fantastic. I really appreciate that. On to urgent business. Councillors, do we have any items of urgent business? No? Thank you. All right. Councillors, we do have one confidential report listed on the agenda, being 17.1, Notice of Motion, Councillor Marcus Pearl, Potential Acquisition. I will now call on a councillor to move that the meeting be closed to members of the public to consider the confidential items. Councillor Martin and a seconder. Who wants to second this? Councillor Nyagui. Um, all those, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Thank you. That's carried. Uh, councillors will now conclude, this will now conclude the public part of the meeting. I advise members of the public that there is no further items open to be discussed. This will be the conclusion of the public meeting. Thank you all for joining us in person. Teresa, thanks for staying and online.